Uh, so welcome everyone again. Uh, I hope you're all doing okay. Uh, what I want to do today is, uh, as usual, I'll start with a quick recap of what we did yesterday. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, cover the Melitz model today. So we'll talk about the Melitz model for the first uh, part of the lecture. And then I want to move on to estimation. Now, given that yesterday uh, we had the poll, it seems like most of you want me to talk about the gravity model. So I will talk about gravity and estimating uh, the gravity model. But I will also, if I have time, we'll see how it goes. Uh, if we have time, then I will also do productivity um, estimation. So that's the plan. Uh, so let's uh, again uh, think about the story. So when we started the course, we said there's always four questions that we will ask, right? One is, uh, why do countries trade? Uh, why do they trade the way they do? Uh, is trade a good thing? Does it improve welfare? And is it good for everyone? And if not, then who gains and who loses? So those were the four questions that we keep coming back to. Now, uh, why do countries trade? Well, we established it's because of comparative advantage, right? Countries trade because different countries have comparative advantage in different goods. Uh, now, different trade models will tell you that there are different sources of comparative advantage, right? So we saw that the Ricardian model um, says the source of comparative advantage is technological differences. The hexter olin model that we covered yesterday tells us that the source of uh, differences is endowments, factor endowments. Right? Be, uh, countries have different endowments of labor, unskilled labor, skilled labor, capital, and that's what gives them comparative advantage in different uh, goods, and that uh, that's why we have trade. Uh, then we talked about who gains. Uh, is trade a good thing? We saw that in most of these models, we have uh, gains from trade either coming, we showed it through this higher indifference curve that consumers can access or through a higher real wage, right? We saw that. Um, and then finally, the Hexerolene model is a good model to talk about distribution impact. So we talked about trade and inequality a little bit. Uh, and can anyone tell me what the theorem is that helps us talk about trade and inequality in the context of the hexter olin model? Does anyone remember from yesterday, if you were here, what is the theorem that tells you how to think about, uh, yes, so the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, I see that coming in the chat function, very good. So SS, Stolper-Samuelson tells us that if the price of a good falls, then the factor that is used most intensively in that good loses in real terms and the other factor gains. So that's the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. The next uh, theorem we saw is also the Ripchinsky theorem. What is the Ripchinsky theorem? It tells us how the economy adjusts when there are changes in factor endowments. So the example we saw was immigration, which is an increase in labor endowment. You can do the same thing with FDI, right? So if a country gets an influx of labor that increases the labor endowment, and we saw that according to the Ripchinsky theorem, that it doesn't change the wage to rental ratio in the long run. So the returns to factors while uh, shrinking in the other sector. Right? So that was the Ripchinsky theorem. So that's where we ended HO. So HO is a really great model to talk about inequality and distributional issues. If you're interested in development and labor, then those are the theorems you want to be working with. Then we started new trade theory. Where is new trade theory different? First, it can help us talk about intra-industry trade. And the reason for that is it says, let's look at within a sector. So say within cars, but let's look at different varieties of cars. Right? And we saw that when you have a love of variety uh, and the consumer loves variety, that's, that's a basis for international trade. Right? That's what the Krugman's monopolistic competition model tells us. So you don't need any of the neoclassical reasons. You don't need the Ricardian reason, which is technology. You don't need HO reasons for trade endowments. All you need is that two countries merge and each country produces different varieties. And because consumers demand these varieties, uh, you get international trade in new trade theory. Of course, new trade theory also relaxes the assumption of uh, constant returns to scale. So you have an increasing returns to scale model, which in the Krugman setting, we saw that there's a fixed cost and that gives rise to that increasing returns to scale uh, technology. Okay. 
So that is where we left it yesterday. I briefly introduced the motivation for the Mellitz model. So if you remember, I said uh, sometime in, in a lot of fields in economics, theory and empirics talk to each other, right? So for example, the gravity is an empirical trade model with a foundation in physics, but then theory responded uh, to the to this empirical model, right? And so we had micro foundations for the gravity model coming from uh, the Krugman model and also the, the EK, the Eaton Kortum model. Okay. So those are, uh, we established that uh, the Mellitz model was also a reaction to what was shown in the data. So as firm level data became available, there were a lot of stylized facts that came in. One, not all firms within a sector export. Exporting is very rare, right? Uh, exporters tend to be very different. They are typically more productive. They are larger uh, firms. And so we needed a theory that could give us those implications. So that's what we're going to start with today. So we need a theory. And when I say we need a theory, that's because we see certain patterns in the data and we need a theory that can actually tell us why we see those patterns, right? So we need a theory that can incorporate this within sector heterogeneity. So the data tells us that within, say, textiles or within cars, firms are very different. They are heterogeneous. They are, there's a big dispersion in productivity. So we need a theory that incorporates that. We also need a theory that leads to more product firms exporting. Okay, so that's where the Mellitz uh, model comes in. So the Mellitz model comes in where it does this. It brings us these implications by doing two things. First, it's going to introduce what we call a fixed cost of exporting. So exporting is costly. It involves a fixed cost that firms have to pay. That's a, a crucial feature of the Mellitz model. The second thing we have is uh, it is going to have the standard Krugman style feature. So think of Mellitz as uh, Krugman, right, but embellished. So an embellished uh, version, a better version, a supersized Krugman model. That's what Mellitz is. It has uh, this uh, the Krugman foundations of, of monopolistic competition, product varieties, all of that. But in addition to that, it has uh, heterogeneity uh, within the sector. So firms are going to be different in terms of their productivity. Whereas in the Krugman model, we saw they're all the same. All firms are symmetric, right? In Mellitz, firms are going to be different in terms of their productivity. And then you're going to uh, put in this fixed cost of exporting. And these two combined, uh, the, this is going to give us some action uh, and we're going to see how that works. So before I move on, is there anything, um, any questions that I need to address at this point? Anything important? There's one which asks about the short run implications of the Ripchinsky theorem. Uh, do you have anything? Like yeah. So, so she there says is a... that she understands it's a long run theorem, but uh, just for some intuition. Yes. So if you um, if you talk about the short run, uh, we there is a separate model that deals with it. It's called the specific factors model, which is the Ricardo Weiner model. What that model tells you is uh, in the short run, labor can be mobile because labor is typically a mobile factor even in the short run. But capital is in each sector. So you can have, say, machines and footwear, but the, the capital stock will be fixed in each sector because factories are difficult to change in the in the um, short run, right? Now, when you have a setting like that, what you can show is that the Ripchinsky theorem will not hold because what happens is that uh, you have an influx of labor and you keep adding labor to a fixed amount of capital and very soon you're going to start hitting diminishing returns uh, and that means that there is going to be an impact on the on the wage. Okay. So the Rybczynski theorem is is going is not going to hold in some sense. It will hold in the sense that certain sectors are going to expand, right? So the economy will expand, but you're still going to get uh, differences in uh, or an impact on the wage. So Rybczynski will not hold in the short run. And the way to think about that is this uh, specific factors model. Okay. Does that does that answer the the question for now? Yeah. Um, okay. There's one more. J that just came in. I'm just reading it. Yeah. So in Feinstra's textbook, both the Stoker, Samuelson, and Rybczynski are classified under Ricardian models. Do you want to say why? 
uh, under Ricardian, that shouldn't be the case. They are HO theorems. Okay? That should not be. That's not. Yeah, I don't think so. I think they, they should come with the hexterolene setup. So in the Ricardian model, you cannot talk about uh, Stroll per Samuelson simply because it's only one factor of production, right? Uh, so it will come with the HO. Uh, so, I mean, the HO theorem itself might come after Stroll per Samuelson. That is possible uh, because the, the whole thing is a setup, right? So, the HO framework or the HO model itself is the two by two by two uh, general equilibrium model with constant returns to scale. So, that is the broad framework. It is possible that uh, Feenstra introduces the Stroll per Samuelson theorem before the HO theorem. That That is possible, but it all comes within the same um, setup, the, the same uh, framework. Okay, so another one is how new trade theory is different from neoclassical in terms of resources. Uh, in terms of resources, so there are no resource differences in these two um, in in the um, in new trade theory. So if you remember from Krugman, right, both countries had the exact same resource, uh, which was labor. They they had the exact same L capital L, which is the size of the labor force. So there's no resource differences. Everything in the in new trade theory really comes from this uh, love of, of variety. Now, of course, larger countries are going to have uh, more varieties. We saw that. So there is an implication on size. Uh, so if you have different um, countries that are different in size, that, that will have some implications for trade, of course. But you don't need these differential sourcing, um, you know, differential factor uh, endowments to, to generate international trade in, in Krugman. So, yeah, I think uh, there's a related question which says trade place mm -hmm. takes place only due to variety differences. Yes, I think that's true. Um, yeah. Labor and capital endowment have no role to play. We have already clarified that. And is HO Vanek an extension of HO Samuelson? Yeah, so HO Vanek is, is some, when you take the HO model to the theory, what you have to do is to sort of expand the dimensionality, like we did with the, if you remember, we did that with the Don Bush Fisher Samuelson and the EK model for Ricardian, right? Uh, you have to do a similar thing when you look at the HO model when you take it to the data. So that's where the HOV comes in, which uh, says let's increase dimensionality uh, of the model. Uh, we haven't had time to do that extension, right? So I'm just doing the extensions that I think are, are interesting in a sense. I think we can go ahead. No more questions. Okay. Cool. So let's jump into Melitz. So what I'll do for Melitz is I'm going to um, give you the story straight up because it's much easier to digest the model if you know what, where we're going with it. Right. So the first thing about the Melitz model, the characteristic really uh, feature of it is that firms are going to be heterogeneous uh, by productivity. So what you're going to have is this distribution of productivities of a firm. So think that you're in the Krugman setting which means you have this you know, a variety that's differentiated products. It's the same sector now. So again, cars, for, for example, and you have varieties of cars and different firms are producing different varieties, but firms are different in terms of their productivity, right? So here is an example, and this is made up. I've just drawn a productivity distribution of, uh, for firms. Now we're gonna call productivity as fee um, here. And uh, what the Melitz model tells, uh, or, or the basic premise, is that firms are heterogeneous um, by productivity. More productive firms are going to be making more variable profits. Okay? So if we think about an autarky situation, then firms have to pay a fixed cost of production. Because remember, like Krugman, this is a uh, increasing returns to scale type setting. So you have a fixed cost of production that firms must pay. And because more productive firms get more variable profits, they are able to jump this fixed cost of production. They can incur the fixed cost. So in this setting, what you will get is a cutoff or a threshold productivity level. So on this diagram, I have drawn that as a fee of A, right? A is autarky, right? So what is fee of A? Fee of A is the cutoff productivity level above which, so if firms are more productive than uh, that level of fee of A, then those are the firms that are able to jump that fixed cost of production and they can then produce and survive in the market. If they cannot incur, if they cannot cover that fixed cost, then they're going to exit and they're not gonna be producing 
in the market, right? So that's the threshold productivity level. Now, once you open up to trade, you have the same Krugman style idea where you have two countries, both with labor forces L, and you just merge them together. So think of international trade here as just an expansion or a doubling of your market size. That's exactly how it works in Krugman. Now, when firms can access a larger market, what happens is that uh, if you want to export, you have to also incur a fixed cost of exporting. So exporting is not easy. In order to export, firms have to pay a fixed cost. Now, let me pause here a bit and ask you, can, can anyone give me examples of the types of things we are talking about when we say there is a fixed cost to exporting? Any examples? What is what do we mean by a fixed cost to export? What is the fixed cost of exporting? Why is it costly? Tariff barriers. Um, well, I would think of tariffs more as a sort of variable cost, right? So think about upfront costs when you're exporting. What what? So suppose you're a firm and suddenly you want to export to a, to the U.S., right? What do you want to think about in terms of a fixed cost? Anything like transport cost, trade barriers, those, those would be variable costs. Okay. There were okay. some uh, which said FDA approvals standards, uh, 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 approval certificates, yes, and very trade good. licenses, etc. Exactly. So things like license, obtaining licenses, uh, you know, market research, for example, you need to know about your uh, market, right? So you have to do some research on that. You have to set up maybe a foreign exchange office. You have to get lawyers to deal with all the certification issues. Uh, search costs are also pretty high, right? Upfront, you have to search for buyers and, and suppliers. Uh, that, in, that involves um, costs. So all of these come into fixed costs of exporting. So exporting is not easy and there is a non-trivial fixed cost of exporting. Now, what does that do? So what that does is you're going to now have another cutoff because not all firms are going to be able to jump that fixed cost of exporting. Okay? So what international trade does in this setting is now you're going to have two cutoff productivities. The first cutoff productivity is your usual uh, one where you have to jump that production cost in order to just survive in the market, right? But then after that, if you want to export, then you have to jump another fixed cost of exporting. So that gives you another productivity threshold, right? So you're going to have firms where some firms are the very, very less productive firms are not going to be producing at all because they cannot even jump the production fixed cost, right? You're going to have some firms that can that can cover the production fixed cost, but they're not productive enough to cover the export fixed cost. So you're going to have these firms in the middle here. These are firms that are serving the domestic market, but they are not able to serve the foreign market. Okay? So you're going to have firms that exit, firms that stay, but then they're only servicing, say, the Indian market. And then you're going to have the very productive firms that can jump that exporting cost, and they are going to be the ones serving the foreign market. Okay? Now, when firms start to serve the foreign market, they're also going to be expanding, right? Because they are now uh, able to access a much larger market. So they're exporting, uh, which means they are going to suck up some resources from the less productive firms. Because remember, again, you have the labor that cannot move uh, across countries. So because there is this impact through the labor market, some of the less productive firms are going to have to exit. So what international trade does is it shifts this uh, productivity cutoff defined by the production cost, the production fixed cost to the right, right? So fee A moves to fee D, which means any firm that was in the middle between with productivity levels in between fee A and fee D was able to survive before um, the possibility of exporting. But after liberalization, when it is possible to export, these firms no longer survive. They exit the market because the threshold, threshold productivity level uh, to survive has now gone up. Okay? So that is the basic idea or the intuition behind the Millets model. So if you get the intuition down, then you're, it's going to be much easier to just deal with the mechanics uh, of the model. Okay? Any, any quick questions on this before I move on? Uh, the, a lot of detail is going to follow. Yeah, so there's one comment, I think, which says in special cases, voluntary export restrictions may serve as a mm -hmm. fixed cost. Uh, okay, so if you have quota type, yeah, 
uh, yeah, that that's a very maybe different... maybe it's like bidding for a quota. Sure. I, you need more lawyers, maybe. Uh, anything else? Can we jump into the model now? No. So the people are asking about this exit thing. Yeah. Uh, I think people want one more brief explanation. Uh, okay. Access labels. I think probably not clear yet. Okay. Look, this is not a. I just drew this this diagram, right? This is not a formal diagram. We will have a more formal treatment is going to follow. I just want you to have a general idea before I get into the model. Okay, so let me quickly explain the the exit uh, exit idea. So, what is the exit idea? The idea is before trade, there was just one productivity cutoff, and that productivity cutoff is where if you are able to jump that cutoff, it's it's basically because you're able to cover that fixed cost of production, then you survive in the market. That that's what happens before trade. Now, once trade is liberalized, then that means that. Uh, you now can export, so you have that option available. But in order to export, you're going to have to incur the fixed cost of um, exporting. Okay. Now, because you have to incur the fixed cost of exporting, it's only the most productive firms that are going to be able to incur that fixed cost of exporting and then export. So those exporting firms are going to then start servicing the foreign market. They're going to start uh, becoming bigger, which means they're going to take up more resources. You can think of it that way intuitively. And so through the labor market, the wages are going to start, uh, they're going to bid up the wages, right? And the, the labor market is sort of in the background of all of this. And what that means is that the least productive firms are now no longer uh, competitive enough to survive in the market. So they are going to, some of them are going to have to exit. So the way that um, happens in the model is that this fee A cutoff, the one we had before trade, is now going to shift to the right to fee D, which means the productivity threshold to now operate in the domestic market has gone up, right? So the firms in between FIA and FIDE earlier, they were they had cleared the threshold and they were producing and selling in the Indian market. But now, because Indian firms are also exporting, the most productive firms are now exporting, which means these guys are no longer um, competitive enough. So some of the, the less productive firms that were earlier surviving are going to survive anymore okay so anything between fee of a and fee of d will exit good shall we yeah i think is there's one better? other question but i think you've already answered that and the other one is a comment which we can now you know because the model is not about uh, how to take care of these exits and all one person has commented that you can subsidize these firms but that's a different question and, oh yeah, uh, that is a totally different question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, will this be a dynamic, and will fee D keep on shifting? So yeah, I think that uh, may be. Uh, yeah, th this is a, this is just a one shot thing. Okay, so we will we will get to that, but we're only thinking of this as you open up to trade, and then the fee D shifts, and you have exit. That's it. Now, in reality, what you say may be true, as as more and more markets open up, it might be a, a dynamic process, right? But the model is simple. Okay. okay, so then I think I'm ready to jump into the model, right? So Melitz 2003, uh, again, one of the key models in international trade today. So you cannot go to an international trade conference without hearing about the Melitz model uh, in most presentations, right? So it's an important model to know. Uh, so let me set this up. Uh, demand side, uh, this is by now, If you, we, since we've done the Eaton Courtroom model, this is going to be familiar to a lot of you. So the utility function is your standard CES type utility function. If you are uncomfortable with integrals, you can just substitute summations for integrals. It's the same thing. Uh, intuitively, it's the same thing. It's just that uh, integral is infinite sum, right? So what is utility? Utility it comes from consuming a whole range of varieties. So in the Mellitz model, a car variety, let's say, is indexed by omega here. Okay? So utility comes from uh, consuming a whole range of different varieties, summed, but it's a weighted sum here. So a weighted sum of all these different uh, product varieties. The weights are um, rho, so rho drop elasticity of substitution. So here you have sigma, which is one over one minus rho. That uh, gives you the substitution between these different uh, product varieties for the consumer. Okay. 
Now, consumers are going to maximize utility subject to a budget constraint. The budget constraint looks uh, the, the same, right? So it's price times quantity for each uh, product variety and then summed over all the product varieties that has to equal the budget. So you can think of R as just income or expenditure in the economy. Now, uh, this is a standard max utility maximization of a CES function subject to the budget constraint. So the demand function looks very standard. So this is your CES demand Q of omega, variety omega is equal to Q uh, times brackets P over uh, capital P to the power negative sigma. Now, let's talk about the intuition a little bit because this P is important. So what the P is, is it is the aggregate price index in the economy. So think of this as sort of the aggregate price of cars uh, in India. And how do you get that? It's just the weighted sum again of the prices of all the different varieties of cars where the weights are um, the one minus sigma. So think of P as sort of the overall price. And then the small letter P is the price of one particular car, which is Omega. So if Omega is uh, your, let's say, um, you know, Toyota, then uh, P over capital P is telling you how expensive is the Toyota relative to the overall price of cars in India. Okay. So now since this is raised to negative sigma, remember, it's almost like you're flipping it. So it's almost like small p is in the denominator and capital P is in the numerator because you're raising it to a negative number, right? So what this is telling us is if um, the price of Toyota goes up, then because it's in the denominator, the quantity is going to go down. Whereas if the price of overall cars go up, and this is important, then what happens is that... Uh, because all cars overall are becoming more expensive, Toyota is relatively cheaper, right? So this is capturing the relative price of Toyota compared to all other cars. And that's going to increase the demand for, for Toyota. So that's the intuition behind this CES uh, function, the demand function. Okay, so let's go to the supply side then. Uh, as I said, this is a very Krugman style uh, model. Um, so I think someone asked a question about Q. Yes, Q is the, the aggregate, right? The total... Q, which is an aggregate uh, Q, total Q. Okay, so monopolistic competition, very much like Krugman. As I said, we're going to have the fixed cost of production, also like Krugman. Uh, costs are going to be expressed in terms of uh, the unique factor of production. So labor is going to be the factor of production. We take L as the numerator here, right? So that's that's labor. So what is total cost? It's the fixed cost plus uh, the variable cost uh, times Q, right? Which is your quantity uh, produced. Now the fee here indexes the fact that these different firms uh, ha are producing these different varieties and fee is the productivity of a particular firm. So the total cost is defined for a firm with productivity level fee. So if you are a firm with fee as your productivity, your total cost is going to be your fixed cost plus your marginal costs. And note that one over fee here is a, a marginal cost of production. Okay. Now, why is this one over fee? Because remember that the marginal cost and productivity are sort of inverse of each other. So if you're more productive, then your marginal cost is going to be lower. It's one over fee. So firms with higher fee are more productive. And so they need fewer workers to achieve the same level of output. So this fee is important in Mellets because this is where the heterogeneity is going to come in. Different firms will have different fees. And because they have, so firms that have a high fee are going to have low costs. They're going to um, charge lower prices. They will produce more output. So they're going to be larger. They're going to obtain more revenue and more profits. So productivity drives all of these things uh, in the Mellets model and firms look different. Okay. So that was the supply side. Now, profit maximization is your simple marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So if you solve MR equals MC, uh, then you're going to get this condition. P of fee equals one over rho times fee. So remember, rho comes from your demand, uh, demand the CES demand function, a uh, utility, sorry. So P is going to be one over rho times 
fee. In other words, price is simply a uh, constant markup over the marginal cost. So here the marginal cost, if you remember, is just one over fee. Right? So the price is going to be a markup, and that markup is, of course, a function of rho that comes from the CES function. So let's once we have solved for the price, and the price looks pretty simple here, it's just a constant markup over cost, we substitute for price in the demand equation. So if you remember, we, we derived the CES demand uh, function, right? So we just substitute for P in that function, and that is going to give us this expression for Q. Once I have uh, the expression for Q, I can calculate revenue. So revenue for a firm of productivity fee is P times Q. And that is simply this expression. All, all we've done is multiplied the P and the Q. And then I can define profits. So profit is just your uh, revenue minus your um, total costs, right? So, and that, um, if you solve that out, that is essentially one over sigma R, which is the revenue minus your fixed cost F. Now, one important thing to note here is that the ratio of revenues or profits of two firms will simply depend on the ratio of their productivities. So how can we see that? If you go here, for example, if I look at this equation for revenue, R of fee, then, uh, and that's given by that expression on the right, if I have two firms, uh, one with productivity fee one and the other with productivity fee two, then if I take the ratio of the revenues of those two firms with productivities uh, fee one and fee two, then all I'm doing is dividing this where fee is fee one divided by the same expression, but with fee as fee two. And so most of these things will get canceled and what will remain is simply a, a, a weighted ratio of the, the two productivities, fee one and fee two. Okay? So I can express the ratio of revenues or profits of any two firms simply using the ratio of their productivities, right? Okay, uh, now let's move on to what the, 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 what the game looks like, right? So what is the time timeline here? What are the different stages? So the first thing is that firms face uncertainty as to how productive they're going to turn out to be. So firms do not know how productive they're going to be. They know that they're going to be drawing their productivity level from a distribution, but they don't know exactly what that, what that draw is, right? So upon entering, they will pay a fixed cost of entry. So F of E is an entry cost. So think of this as just simply setting up a, a firm, right? So you have to get your license to set it up and, and buy a rent a property and all of that. So that is the fixed entry cost. Remember F E is different from F. F is the fixed cost of production. FE is the fixed cost of entry. Now, once firms enter, they pay that cost, and it's only after they pay the cost that they draw their productivity from this distribution. So what is the distribution fee or the productivity distribution? We assume that that density, the probability density is given by G of phi, and the, the distribution is capital G of phi. So the density and the distribution functions for this productivity. Firms are then going to draw their productivity from that distribution. After they observe the productivity, then the firms will decide whether they want to produce or not. If they decide they want to produce, they carry on. If they decide they don't want to produce, then they simply exit. Okay, They don't, they don't produce. Okay, so let's consider a firm. So the firm is considering production. So it has paid the entry cost, then it has incurred a draw, right? A productivity draw. Now it wants to decide whether it should produce or not. Now, in order to decide, what is it going to look at? It's going to look at, well, now that I'm here, what are the profits that I'm, I'm going to make? So it is looking at this discounted uh, profit that it can make, right? So we're going to define discounted profit as V of fee for a firm of productivity level fee. And that's going to be the maximum of zero, which is if the firm doesn't produce, it makes zero, or this stream of uh, profits pi, which is a function of fee and then appropriately discounted uh, uh, to the present value. Right? So this is your discounted stream of profits. So you're going to look at the maximum of either zero, which means you won't produce, or if you produce, you're going to get this discounted uh, profit, one over delta uh, pi of fee. Okay? Now, because there the, the 
profit is going to be increasing in fee star. So remember that pi of fee is bigger, the more productive you are, right? More productive firms make more pi. And so what that means is you're gonna have a value of fee star that I told you about. This is your cutoff productivity level fee star, such that this profit, the expected profit that you can make, the discounted profit is positive if and only if fee is greater than fee star. So your, your profit will be greater than zero only if you clear that uh, threshold productivity level. In other words, your variable profits will be enough to cover that fixed cost of production. Right. So if I were to put that on a diagram, for now, just ignore this pi of X line, right? Because this come, this happens after trade. So simply focus on the pi of fee uh, line here. So what we have on the X axis is we are plotting the productivity levels. So this is fee. It's been raised to sigma minus one, but that doesn't matter. So as you go to the right, it's higher and higher productivity fee. Okay, so if your productivity level is zero, then of course, you know, you have to, you still incur the fixed cost. So negative F here is the fixed cost of production. As your productivity level goes higher and higher and higher, you're making more and more um, uh, variable profits, right? And at, at some point, right? So that means your profits are going to keep rising as your productivity level rises. And at some point, you're going to make enough variable profits to cover the fixed cost. Right. And then from then on, your profits will be strictly positive. So this is that fee star that's called the cutoff productivity threshold or the threshold productivity level in the Mellitz model. Now, once we have this cutoff uh, productivity level, what we will then have is we are going to solve for the total number of firms. We have the prices, right? We know which firms are, uh, we now have to talk about the industry equilibrium. We know which firms will produce, which firms will not uh, with the cutoff. Let's look at what the industry equilibrium looks like. Uh, so we're going to have to solve for the M, for the number of firms and the num in that, that survive, that survive and that produce. So let's look at the distribution of producing firms mu of phi. Now, let me point out that this distribution mu of phi is different from the G distribution, right? Because the G distribution is the X and A distribution of uh, uh, productivities. What mu is, is the, is the uh, distribution of firms that are producing in the market that survive and that, that decide to produce. So we can now express everything. This is the good thing about the Mellitz model is that all the action is really coming from this phi star, right? So we can actually express pretty much all the equilibrium conditions as functions of that cutoff productivity phi star. So let's first define the average productivity level in the, uh, in the industry. So we're going to call that phi tilde. Tilde means average. So average productivity in the industry, in the car industry here, is going to be the integral going from zero to infinity uh, of the productivity levels of all the firms that are actually manufacturing or that have not exited and that, that are still in the market. So that's picked up by this mu. So I'm simply taking the expected productivity levels of all the firms that are uh, that remain in the market producing. So mu is going to be, as I said, the ex post uh, dis uh, productivity distribution. Okay? So it's the distribution of producing firms. And we already know what that mu is going to look like. Okay? So we know that if the firms, for the, all the firms that have um, jumped that productivity threshold, so for all the productivity levels that are greater than or equal to the threshold productivity level phi star, uh, the probability of, of those is just G divided by one minus G because this is the conditional uh, productivity distribution, right? So G is the density function and then you have to divide because you're conditional, conditioning on the fact that they are producing, you have to divide by one minus the capital G, which means the probability that your phi is greater than um, or equal to phi star. Okay, and then zero otherwise. So mu is going to be zero if the firm's productivity level falls below the phi star because then that firm is not going to be producing. Okay. Okay, so let me incorporate that. So the average productivity in the industry can be written as a function of the cutoff. So what is the average productivity level? I'm going to write that as a function of phi star. Why are we writing this as a function of phi star? Because the phi star determines the average productivity level. Okay, so 
fee average is going to be, I'm just simply substituting. So in here, I'm going to substitute for the mu. I have derived what the mu looks like, right? So I'm going to say, instead of mu, we're gonna write G of phi and then take the one over one minus G of phi star uh, outside because it doesn't depend on the phi. Okay. Now, when I'm integrating, of course, I'm integrating from phi star to infinity because below phi star, uh, mu is zero, right? So it doesn't count. So I can just go directly from phi star to infinity. So this expression here gives us the average industry level productivity uh, in the country once that phi star has been determined. Uh, so we will then define the average profit in the industry. We're going to call that pi bar. That's average profits. It's simply the profit evaluated at the average productivity level phi tilde. Okay. So what is pi bar? That we know what the profit function looks like. We derived that on, I think, the, the second slide. Okay. So p bar is going to be simply r of the average uh, phi tilde over sigma minus f. But we also saw that I can write this as simply the ratio of the two productivity levels multiplied by R of phi star, okay? And that is because in the Mellitz model, the ratio of two productivities is simply a ratio of the, uh, the fees, okay? So if you take the revenue, the ratio of the revenues of these two firms, I can write that as simply a function of the ratios of uh, the two productivity levels. So that means that I can write pi bar as that expression to the right with some algebraic manipulation and using the fact that R of phi star is simply equal to F, I can then um, simplify that equation to this. Okay? So this pi bar equals that expression, the last expression to the right, that is called the ZCP curve. Now ZCP means zero cutoff productivity curve. So that's going to be one curve that we are going to uh, to consider. The second curve uh, is that we have the free entry condition. Okay? So the expected discounted value of profits has to equal the fixed cost of entry in equilibrium. So firms will only enter if uh, the fix the entry cost is made up for by their expected, by the expected future, uh, the discounted profits that they will make, which is zero to infinity V times G of D of V. So that gives us the free entry condition, which is that the pi bar has to equal the discounted uh, fixed uh, entry cost. Okay? Now this is called the FE condition. And we're going to put these two conditions together. Note that this is upward sloping in phi star. So if phi star is high, then G of phi star is very small. One minus G of phi star is high, okay? And so that means this is, this is much lower, right? So we're gonna have an upward sloping FE and a downward sloping ZCP. Okay? So I put that together, ZCP and FE, and that gives me the average profit. So we have profits on the Y axis, phi on the X axis, and these two lines intersecting will give us the equilibrium productivity um, threshold, right? Fee star in Turkey and the average profits in Turkey. So what we have done here is we have uh, basically calculated the cutoff productivity level in equilibrium in Turkey and the average industry profits that go with that Turkey um, cutoff. Once we, once in the Mellitz model you get your fee star, you can get everything else because all the action in Mellitz comes from the cutoff uh, productivity level. So we can then solve for that aggregate price index. Like if you remember, we did this for the Eaton Cortum model as well, right? So we derived the overall average aggregate price index um, for the industry. So that's here capital P, one minus sigma, and that's just the integral over all the varieties of the, the different prices of the varieties, right? I can now substitute in for price, and that's your rho uh, phi, sigma minus one here. I multiply by uh, the density function, the exposed density function mu, and then also the m, which is the weight, is the total number of firms in equilibrium. So that is equal to the expression here, m rho phi tilde to the sigma minus one. We then substitute for big uh, capital P into the uh, equation for profits. 
So that's pi bar equals one over sigma r over m minus f. And then we set r equal to L because we have normalized the wager to one. Right? So wage is normalized to one, which means r or total GDP is simply L, right? Because L is the, the labor force. So that means m is equal to L over sigma pi bar plus f. Now, if you look at this, this will look similar to the Krugman uh, version that we saw earlier, right? So what this is telling us is M, which is the total number of firms in equilibrium or the total number of varieties, is going to be proportional to the country size. So large countries are going to be able to support a much higher uh, number of firms. Similarly, countries that have low fixed costs of production if this is um, small, then this is going to be large and you're going to get more firms in equilibrium, right? So if you can keep the fixed costs low for firms to produce, you will have uh, a lot more varieties in equilibrium. Now, one thing to note is the fee tilde, the fee star, which is a cutoff productivity, the pi uh, bar and the mu's, all of these are independent of country size L. It's only M, which is the total number of firms that is proportional to country size. This is why we say that in the Mellitz model, a lot is determined by simply the cutoff productivity, right? Um, okay. So that was the autarky situation. So all you need to remember here, I know there's a lot going on, but remember the graph, right? So we had the, the free entry condition, the fact that firms have to, uh, firms look at how much profit they can make. They look at their expected discounted profits and they see where that is equal to, whether that's equal to the free, um, the entry cost, right? So they're going to cover that entry cost. That's the entry condition. And then you have the ZCP uh, condition. So these two will determine fee star and pi bar. Once those are determined, you just plug in and solve for all the other equilibrium values. Okay, so now what we're going to see, that was autarky. So let's open it up now to free trade. This means that you're just going to increase L like we did in Krugman, right? So two, so L and L merge together, they become two. Okay, but the problem here is if you simply increase L, the way the model works, uh, remember that L is only really driving M, right? So nothing else was determined by L. So if you remember the fee tilde, the fee star, pi bar, none of that was dependent on L. So simply changing L is not going to do anything in the model. Now, this is why we were going to have this fixed cost of exporting. So let's introduce the fixed cost of exporting, which is F of EX. And it's exactly like the production cost, but this, again, firms are going to incur this once they learn about their productivity draw. So when it's a trading economy, once the firm learns about it, its productivity draw, it has the option of exporting. If it does export, then it has to incur that F E X. So we have a lot of Fs floating around. Remember F of E is the entry cost. F of F is simply the production fixed cost. And F E X is the exporting fixed cost. Only incurred if you export. Now, of course, if you open up to trade, a lot of you brought up things like tariffs and, and transport costs and, and all kinds of trade barriers, right? So if you open up to trade and you're exporting, of course, you have to incur all those costs. And that's picked up by this transport cost of the iceberg type. So your row here um, is going to be the units needed to ship to receive one unit. So that row is going to be more than one because you have to ship more in order to get one to the to the destination. So that's a type of um, iceberg transport cost. Uh, the domestic economy will trade with n other economies. So we're going to have countries that look identical. There are n of them and they you can export to all of them. Okay? All countries are going to be of equal size. Factor price equalization means that wages everywhere are one. So really you have n economies identical that merge and that's how we're thinking about international trade here. So now we have the Mellitz model under trade. Uh, note that the markup over marginal cost is now higher because you have an extra marginal cost for exports, if you remember, right? Because you have the transport cost as well. So that is also a marginal cost. And so now the markup over marginal cost is going to be higher. So for uh, RD, so this is the domestic uh, uh, R here, revenue, that's going to be your usual RP uh, rho fee to the sigma minus one, exactly like before. 
But then you're going to have this exporting revenue. So R X of fee is the exporting revenue earned by a firm with productivity level fee. And the only difference there is, of course, you're going to have a different um, exporting revenue from different markets because you have N countries and you're exporting to all of these N countries. Uh, and then for exporting, you have to pay this extra row, which is a variable cost. It's a variable transport cost. So then let's look at what firm revenue is going to look like under trade. Now, things are a bit more complicated now because firms, some of these firms are going to be exporting and selling the domestic market, right? So what is total revenue? Well, it depends on what type of firm you are. If you're a firm that does not export, then your revenue is simply the RD of fee, like before. But if you do end up exporting, uh, and if you're exporting to all countries, then you are going to have your domestic revenue. But on top of that, you're going to have N times uh, rho 1 minus sigma times the R of D. In other words, you're also going to have the export revenue. Okay. okay. So your profits are going to, again, be different depending on whether you're an exporting firm or whether you're not. Uh, if you're if you're just a domestic firm, so just domestic profits pi of d is like before. So if you remember this expression, it looks exactly like it did in the autarky's uh, case. But then, what about profits when you're exporting? Well, in that case, you're going to also have this r x over sigma minus f x because that x is exporting profit, okay? and that's just your row. So you're just bumping it up. It's the same as the RD of fee, but you have the extra revenue because of the tau here, okay? Over sigma minus the fixed cost of exporting. Now, this FX is the per period portion of the initial fixed cost. So you can think of the exporting cost. It's a dynamic setting. So this export cost is incurred over time, and we are going to amortize it and just look at delta F of EX. Okay. okay. So then in the in the trading equilibrium, your profit is going to be the sum of the domestic and export profits. So domestic profit plus the export profit, but note that not all firms will export. So it's going to be the maximum of either zero if you're not exporting, or if you're exporting, then you have the N times the exporting profit. So let's look at the present discounted value. I'm simply discounting it. So V of fee now is max of zero comma pi of uh, phi over delta, just like before. And this will now define two cutoff points. The first one, phi um, star, is going to be the domestic cutoff point. So this is the uh, threshold productivity level where the V of phi is just greater than zero. Okay. And then you have the exporting cutoff, which is the productivity level right? Such that, of course, you have covered the domestic, you're able to cover the domestic cost. So definitely you have to be above the domestic threshold productivity fee star, but over and above that, you also should be earning positive export profits because only then can you export, right? So this fee star X is basically the productivity level which is definitely above the domestic cutoff, and it is at a point where the fee, fee uh, the pi of x is greater than zero, positive export profit. So on the graph here, uh, we had the earlier uh, domestic situation. Now we have the situation where we also have the export profits pi x. Okay? And here you can see that um, at zero, this is the exporting fixed cost. So negative f of x is the exporting fixed cost. More productivity means that your profit uh, from exporting uh, rises, and where it hits that line gives the second threshold. So look at how in international trade, there are two productivity thresholds. So all firms that have productivity levels between zero and fee star, these will be the ones that are, uh, they're basically exiting the market because they can't even uh, incur, they cannot even cover that production cost. Anything in between these is going to be firms that have covered the production cost, but they haven't covered the fixed cost of exporting. So these firms will simply sell to the domestic market. And any firm that has higher productivity than the, the fee star of X is going to be able to export uh, and sell in the domestic market. Okay. okay. 
So now note that the FE condition does not really change under trade. So if you look at the FE condition, there isn't much there, uh, right? Except for the, the discount factor and the fixed entry cost, none of that has really changed. And so the FE condition does not change under trade. So it is still true that the expected discounted profits should equal the entry cost. That still holds. But the ZCP condition is going to now look different. Why does it look different? Because now your average profit, pi bar, doesn't just include the domestic profit, but it also includes these exporting profits okay, for the exporters. So that means the right-hand side here has changed from before. And so what we're going to see is under international trade, the ZCP condition shifts to the right because there are more profits to consider. It's not just the domestic profits, it's also the um, exporting profit. Okay. Now, what does that do to the equilibrium? To the equilibrium, you're going to see an increase in fee star and an increase in the average profit pi. Uh, and when we say the fee star goes up, what does that mean? Earlier you had the autarky fee star. Now the autarky fee star has gone to the right. That means the threshold cutoff productivity has increased. If the threshold cutoff productivity uh, to produce goes up, that means you're going to have exit because all the firms in between those are going to exit the market because they can no longer, they've no longer made that, uh, that threshold. Okay, so what is the impact of trade in the Mellitz model? So the first thing is remember that there's no impacts coming through the elasticity of demand. So the elasticity of demand is not really affected. Uh, reallocation is not happening through markups because the markup in this version of the Mellitz model is constant. Okay? So trade is not really resulting in any squeezing out of firms. So where is this whole reallocation coming from? Essentially, it all operates through the factor market or through the labor market. So what happens is trade pro is providing an opportunity for these high productivity firms to expand by exporting. So those firms that can actually jump that cost, uh, they are able to expand by exporting. They're going to draw some labor away from the low productivity firms, and those low productivity firms are going to exit the market. So high productivity firms will benefit most from trade. Okay. So this is really a very, very uh, powerful result, because remember, we started off by saying we want to ex explain some of the facts that are that we see in the data that Krugman cannot really explain. What are those facts? The facts we saw were that, um, look, not all firms in a sector export. Very few firms export. Exporting is rare. Have we explained that with the Mellitz model? Yes, we have explained it because what we have said is not all firms in a sector are going to be able to jump that fixed cost of exporting because not all of them are productive enough to do so. Okay? So that means we have now, uh, we have a model that can generate that result, which is that only some firms export. Right. The second thing we wanted is we wanted to show this idea that exporters are different from non-exporting firms. Exporters are larger, they're more productive, right? And that is exactly what we find. So in the Mellitz model, because it is only the most productive firms that can cover that exporting fixed cost, you're going to see that exporters are more productive than uh, non-exporters. And they're also going to be larger, right? They're, they produce more output, they have more profits, they have more revenues, um, and so on. So we have a model that actually can uh, generate a lot of those results that we see in the data. This is why people like the Mellitz model, because it can be used to explain um, what we find in the data. Okay, so uh, there are two extensions of the Mellitz model, and I don't have time to go into them. One is Bernard, Redding, and Schott which basically also introduces product heterogeneity within firms. So it's blowing up the Mellitz model into several dimensions. So in Mellitz, you just have firm heterogeneity. With Bernard, Redding, and Schott, you have within firm and across product heterogeneity. So if you have data sets, uh, for example, where you have firms and you also know the products that they're producing, then the Bernard, Redding, and Schott is a very good model uh, to use. And then finally, Mellitz and Otaviano, they have this variable markup model. So that model is a little bit different. It generates very similar results, right? Uh, but the, the mechanisms are very different because there you have variable markups and um, you, you're going to have pro-competitive effects and so on. So that's uh, the Mellitz and Otaviano version. So those of you who are interested can also, also look into that. 
So that was the Mellitz model. So I'm going to take any questions. Now I know, look, the Mellitz model is not something you can do in, in, in one hour, right? So I have tried to just give you an overview, but if you're interested, you, you will have at least a flavor of the model, right? And that's what I've tried to give you. So any questions on Mellets? One uh, is, uh, can reallocation affect work through tougher product market competition? Um, so that's one. And the, the other is, um, yeah, ZCP and uh, FE conditions more intuitively. And any references for Mellets model? Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, the reference for Mellitz model, unfortunately, is Mellitz. So you're going to have to sit down with the paper. So it takes a couple attempts, but I think if you can, if you can, you can use the slides here to just give you, uh, because the slides pick up the essential parts, right? And so you can use those um, to guide you, but really the reading for Mellitz is uh, is Mellitz. Product market competition, I would urge you to look at the Mellitz uh, Octaviano setup. So you're going to see a lot of uh, impacts from competition, right? So it's a it's a combination really of Mellitz and more of these pro-competitive uh, or impacts of competition, right? So it will tell you whether the impacts of trade can work uh, through that. So I, I think Mellitz and Octaviano is a good reference for that. Uh, and the ZCP uh, and conditions, right? Is that it was that the last question was about that, right? Uh, yeah, those conditions uh, more intuitively as opposed to the math. Ah, okay. So uh, intuitively speaking, this is saying that. Let me go back to the FE condition. Yeah. So this is saying that the expected value. So. Uh, the, what you're expecting as your profits, right, should be enough to cover the the entry cost, right? So this is saying that if you uh, if you if the cutoff productivity level is very high, uh, okay, uh, and so that means that uh, once you uh, once you draw, you have to have a very high productivity level in order uh, to be able to produce and cover your uh, your entry cost. Okay. So it becomes much harder to your ex the expectation that you will cover your entry cost is that uh, is is it's that much harder to do it if the end, the cutoff uh, level is very high, right? So that is why this is upward sloping. So you need more profits in a sense to be able to cover the entry cost if the cutoff is very high. That is the probability that you will actually make that threshold is very high. So that is why that free, uh, the entry condition is upward sloping. So uh, higher uh, threshold productivity um, can only be sustained at higher uh, average profit levels, given that you have to cover your entry, your entry cost. And does that make sense? Uh, okay. And, and yeah. so this one here comes from the uh, ZCP. So this has got nothing to do with entry. It is simply picking up the relationship between what would the average profit levels look like in the industry as the cutoff productivity level goes higher and higher and higher. So it's really coming from the distribution of productivity. So if you have a very high cutoff uh, productivity level, then what is what is the average profit in the industry going to look like and that is that comes from how these fees operate right so for different distributions of fee for example in mellets they have the pareto distribution which is what a lot of the the models use if you want to structurally estimate you use the the pareto distribution right so all that is saying is what's the relationship between your um, average profit, what does it look like in the industry if the cutoff in that industry is very high so that you only have the most uh, productive firms producing in the market. And it turns out that given the shape of that uh, density function, that's a downward sloping line here. Okay, so that is your ZCP condition. Uh, is that any any other questions along along those lines? Um, I think you answered that. The, the other one is just about uh, the domestic threshold productivity. Will it not go up if the higher productivity firms have an option of exporting? 
Yes, that is exactly what happens. So it does go up, right? So because the high productivity firms start exporting, the domestic productivity threshold does go up. And that's why you have the exit, right? So in between the, the all the firms that uh, earlier could make the threshold, but now cannot make the threshold because that threshold has gone up, they are the ones that will exit. Yeah, uh, another is according to Mellet's model, what improves trade other than productivity? Very good question. Very, very good question. Um, so uh, can the policy makers among the participants put your policy hat on? What is the policy implication here? What makes, uh, what makes firms export? So of course, um, more productivity means that for higher productivity firms are going to export. That's that's true. But if you want to increase exports, what would you do? Note that the productivity is just a random draw here, right? So product that's one of the downsides of the uh, Mellet's model is it doesn't really tell you what is driving this productivity. It's simply a distribution. So you just randomly draw your productivity level, right? It doesn't say much about where that comes from. But how would I uh, increase exports, for example? People are thinking in terms of scaling. Fixed uh, fixed cost. cost, very good. So note that a lot of this is the fixed cost, right? So if I can lower the fixed cost of exporting, then can I uh, have more firms uh, exporting? The extensive margin of exporting goes up, right? So more firms are going to be able to export if I can keep the fixed costs low. So what does that mean? What should the government do then if it wants to keep fixed costs low? Uh, so think of things like make, uh, you know, making licensing easy, right? So don't make exporters jump through hoops, uh, spread more information on uh, on customers abroad, accessing markets uh, abroad, right? Reducing search costs for buyers and sellers, uh, availability of financing, exactly. So anything that can reduce, that can make life easier for exporters in terms of all these barriers to exporting, that is going to improve um, your extensive margin, right? More firms exporting. Okay, very good. So let me, are there any other questions on the model itself? Uh, Gautam? I think there was one that you could address. It was a good question. Uh, uh, right. So the firms that uh, export, do they yeah. do their uh, productivity increase in the domestic market? So it's a no. So you want to no, so this one does not incorporate that. So here the productivity is simply a one shot draw. So you just draw your productivity and you either are very productive or you're not productive. Th that's it in this model. So it is, it is not very satisfactory in that regard. Yes. Okay, so becoming more productive uh, because you are uh, now exporting, those types of learning by exporting um, aspects are not covered in this. I think uh, the next question is like, uh, will they become more competitive again? The answer is no. I think we can move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They they don't become more competitive. It's it's inherently this is this is telling you they export because they are competitive because they are productive. Okay. okay. So what I want to do is and we're now transitioning to the estimation, right? But before that, I want to point out um, that there is a policy implication of Mellets, right? Suppose that I'm the Indian government. Okay. And what I find is that after trade liberalization, uh, the industry, I only have access, let's say, to industry level data. So I can only look at productivity at the industry level. So I know what is happening to productivity in cars overall, in textiles and in apparel, right? And I see that after trade liberalization, the car industry is becoming more productive. Overall aggregate industry productivity is going up. Can I conclude that car firms, because I liberalized trade, car firms have become more productive? Can I conclude that from the, from the data? No, so I cannot conclude. And why is that? Why can I not conclude that car firms have become more productive because I see the industry productivity going up? Yes, very good. So I think some people are picking this up. Very good. Uh, be, I cannot conclude that because it could simply be that the less productive firms are exiting the market. Okay, So this is a very, very important policy implication. Do not use industry. You cannot say much um, 
on the impact of trade if you don't have firm level data because if you look at industry productivity of course the industry productivity is going to go up because the least productive firms are going to exit and all you will have are the more productive firms so it will simply be a selection story uh, this is why in order to look at the impact of trade on productivity you need firm level data you need to be looking at what is going on within firms so that's one important policy implication of melits the second policy implication is look this model is depressing because it's telling you that uh, exporting firms are going to expand at the expense of less productive firms there is a distributional uh, implication of this because we already saw that exporters are very different from non-exporters right so if exporters start expanding what type of workers do you think they are going to start hiring and are they going to be the same workers that the low productivity firms are firing okay, so is that is, are, are workers just seamlessly going to move from low productivity firms to high productivity firms is the question not really because exporters as they are expanding they're probably also upgrading technology they're upgrading quality of their products right and we know that that's what export markets require and that means they're probably from these exiting firms are simply going to be absorbed into these big exporters that are exporting that that's just not realistic so there's going to be a lot of uh, friction in the labor market and, th and that's why i think we need to think about other domestic policies as well so things like reskilling programs uh, are, are extremely important in this context right uh, upskilling or reskilling that will kind of ease the transition between uh, workers that are basically losing their jobs because firms are exiting uh, and and then move them towards the the firms that are actually expanding uh, using exports so that there's another distributional implication as well okay so uh, uh, do you think this is a good time to break uh, gautam or should i go a little bit more and then i think uh, because we i think can break uh, so what is the next agenda? We have the gravity yes. and the two. Correct. So my next plan is to go to lecture three. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be starting with the gravity model. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the estimation and then we will go to the estimation. And then if I have time, I'll come back and talk about productivity estimation and then go to the data again. So that's the plan. Okay. I think there may be one question we can address before we leave. Uh, there's yeah. a question say asking where does productivity come from? Is it only labor or capital or both? I mean, I think is it PFP or labor uh, only on labor, etc. And any model extensions to consider? Uh, that's a very good question. So in the model, it is it doesn't say much about productivity. So all it says is that your marginal cost goes down. That can happen because you have TFP improvements. Uh, it can happen because you have your labor productivity goes up. So even if you simply are working with more machines, uh, your labor productivity is going to go up and that that will fit the bill. So the Mellitz model, you can talk, think about it as, as TFP or labor productivity. Okay. Uh, the Mellitz model is not a good model to probe what exactly um, productivity is, where it comes from. And so there is a lot of um, work that after that, that that actually talks about that. But it's not a good model if you want to look at uh, the impacts uh, coming from productivity, right? So technology, uh, TFP, it's not a great model for that. But it does say that overall productivity matters. That's the punchline. The punchline is no matter where your productivity differences are coming from if you're more productive maybe that's because you use more machines and your labor productivity is high or you have better technology and and uh, your product your tfp is high whatever the source of productivity is higher more productivity means you're more likely to export that's that's what melitz tells us uh, in terms of the extensions as i said look at look at melitz otaviano look because I, this is not a good model for competitive you know product market competition impacts for that you have to go with the Mel, uh, the, the uh, melitz otaviano model uh, and then the bernard reading i would yeah so though the two extensions i mentioned are a good place to start and the literature, look, the literature is huge. Melitz has spawned a very, very big literature. So you, you should be able to follow um, from there. I, what I wanted to do in this course is really give you the Melitz model because without Melitz, you are lost 
in today's uh, trade, um, you know, in the field of international trade. So this is the minimum that I have given you. Uh, there is a lot more that people have done over and above this. There's one comment which says productivity increases over time. Uh, so in this model, a firm producing for domestic market can never become an exporter. Uh, that's true unless they are in the border uh, and the policies reduce fixed costs or variable uh, costs. Yeah, unfortunately, you can't improve your productivity levels and, and uh, start exporting. That's not something because this is just a one shot, right? You're always drawing your productivity from this distribution. So it doesn't really talk about that. I agree. Yeah, about that, there's like uh, papers by Alessandria and Choi, which do this in a business cycle framework. So they and uh, firm productivity changing over time in a general equilibrium setting is only, I think, being looked at in the business cycle research. Um, OK, that thing. is good to know. I see. Yeah. OK, because otherwise people just look at partial equilibrium for their own. Yeah, just I mean, look, look at the. Yeah, the, the dynamics are very hard to, to get at. So I don't, the trade literature doesn't really treat dynamics very seriously, right? I mean, there is, if you look at the Mellitz model, well, there's some discounting and so on, but it's, it's really sad the, the extent of dynamics uh, there is in these models. So the trade literature doesn't do that very well. But I mean, it's good to know that the business cycle literature is taking that uh, more seriously. Yeah, even there, it's not perfect, but uh, I mean, there is some element of it just to see how, uh, exporters dynamics change over time um, but the main uh, shock there is the aggregate productivity shock okay so that's right, one. right. and uh, i think one question there is one request to explain the policy implications of melitz model we'll take this is the last one you'll take i think before break and then we'll have a 15 minute uh, yes. So the policy implications for me, right, again, uh, you have to just hand wave when it comes to policy implications. But for me, from the Mellitz model, the key ones are fixed costs matter. Okay. Setting aside the issue of where productivity comes from, we know that more productive firms will are the ones that can incur these fixed costs. So if you want to get more action on the extensive margin, i.e. you want more firms to export, then you should be looking at lowering the, the fixed costs. And that is something the government can do because they can uh, look into easing licensing uh, restrictions, you know, setting up uh, these export shows where they can disseminate information on various markets. They can help uh, buyers find sellers and sellers find buyers and so on. That's something the government can do, it's something concrete. The other is the distributional aspects, as I said, for policy. Uh, so anything to do with skilling of labor is also something that I think is very important because what is happening here is a classic trade story, right? What is the classic trade story? So you start, um, once you have trade liberalization, some sectors are going to shut down, other sectors are going to expand because you're going to specialize in comparative advantage, right? That's your neoclassical story. But with the Mellitz model, it's the same thing, but it's within sectors. So even within sectors, these product firms are going to be expanding and the other, the low productivity firms are going to be exiting. And so anything the government can do to ease that transition when it comes to labor, uh, I think that that would be very, very useful. So all of this stuff about informal sector, right? So there's a large literature in India and other developing countries on the impact of trade on the informal sector. Where is the informal sector in the Mellitz model? It's, it's probably the left of the distribution. Okay, so informal sector firms typically are very small. They don't invest a lot in technology. They are quite labor intensive. Their labor productivity is often low. And so what is going to happen when you have trade liberalization? Potentially, a lot of these uh, informal firms are just going to disappear. And the large formal ones, at least that's what the theory says, right? So there is an implication for labor, I think, coming from the Mellitz model, though Mellitz doesn't really talk about it. But I think for me, that is an important story. Sure. Oh, cool. I think uh, we can now break. Uh, okay, so, so let's break for 15, right? And then we come yeah. back for the data stuff. Right. So 335? Yeah. Okay. 335. Okay. Sounds good. Bye. Okay.
we can start now yeah I one thing maybe start. i can uh, just tell uh, like the uh, one dynamic extension for melets is uh, gironi in melets 2005 paper i can post the okay. reference mm -hmm. in the chat box but it's yes. one of the dynamic extensions so, again here uh, even in their case productivity is not changing over time but uh, it is a dynamic model it is a business cycle model uh, so in that sense it's an extension of dynamic extension of me. i see i see it's so a 2005 right okay yeah no oh, that's a good i will make note of that yeah for a lot of uh, business cycle research uh, with heterogeneous firms that's the that's like the melitz 2003 equivalent i see i see so it's the melitz uh, version for business cycle yeah. Models. yeah yeah okay so um i think i can move on uh, at some point i will also get back to the two questions i had down for yesterday which was unemployment in extroline and uh, the balasa samuelson i'll come to that but let me first motivate the the gravity model of trade okay so we're switching hats now we're moving on to more estimation uh, issues so let's start with the gravity model now i told you the story behind the gravity model of trade right so this was really uh, an empirical model it had no foundation in international trade theory uh, right so this comes from the from newton's gravity law of gravity right so it says that the gravity between two objects uh, is inversely proportional to the distance so the bigger the distance between the two objects the less is the gravity between them and it says that objects that have a larger mass are going to have more gravity Right, so that that is the basic idea behind uh, gravity in physics. And so, what trade um, economists were doing is they simply adapted that model to international trade. So they modeled international trade as a function of the distance between two countries and the economic mass of the two countries. So, in other words, the GDP of country one and the GDP of country two. And what they found was that this uh, empirical model was a beautiful fit. Uh, to the data in the sense it could really explain trade flows. Okay. So then what happened was, um, but people were not fully happy because there wasn't any economic foundation for why the gravity model was such a good fit for the day. Right? So that is where, as I said, uh, the Krugman model comes in. So in the Krugman model, which is a monopolistically competitive model, uh, what it gives you is this idea that larger countries produce more varieties and when you have increasing returns to scale, larger also means that you're more competitive. Okay. So it, it, in a sense, with the Krugman model, what you will find is larger countries uh, tend to trade more with each other. So in that sense, it is a very good foundation for the gravity model. So from Krug, Krugman, the Krugman uh, uh, monopolistic competition model is one of the first theoretical foundations for the gravity model. And it implies that larger countries are going to trade more with each other and countries that are more similar in size are going to trade more with each other. Okay. So that's one foundation. And the other foundation, the more recent one, is the eaton Kortum model that we uh, did in the, in the Ricardian lecture, right? So if you remember from the eaton Quartum model, we derived this expression for the probability that a country N imports from a country I. And that was a function of the uh, absolute advantage or technology in country I, the cost of production, marginal cost of production in country I, the distance or transport cost between the two countries N and I, and then also this fee of N term, which if you remember was simply um, sort of the aggregate uh, cost of supplying that commodity to this country N from, from all other, from all suppliers across the world, right? So uh, we also defined uh, in the empirical sense, pi N I as just simply the uh, share, right, of spending by country N consumers on country I products. In other words, uh, how much N imports from country I divided by the total um, spending in country N, right? So that's the probability that uh, N imports from I. That was another thing we saw in the EK model. Now, if we use the fact 
that the total income of country I is simply going to be the spending on country I products by all other countries in the world. So summation over all countries, how much they spend on I's products. That's just the income in country I. If we use that particular expression, then what we can show with some algebraic uh, manipulation is that uh, X and I, which is you can interpret this as trade flows between country N and country I, because this is simply imports by N from I, right? And that's a function of XN, which is total GDP or production in country N. YI, which is total income or GDP uh, really of country I, the distance between the two raised to the power negative theta, and then this omega i to the power theta, and then divided by phi of n, and omega i to the power um, uh, negative theta, and you can add a theta to that, is defined as the sum uh, of this expression after the summation sign. And what this is, is also in a sense the uh, uh, what we call a resistance term. So in the gravity equation, both the phi n, which is country n specific, and the omega i, which is country i specific, these capture sort of the overall uh, re remoteness of a particular country, right? It's because the overall remoteness of a country is going to drive how expensive it is to ship products to that country. So the, the phi of n is the aggregate cost of shipping um, uh, IDs to that country, as we saw earlier, and the same, the omega i is the same thing for the other country, country i. So we actually call these two terms multilateral resistance terms. So with the improvements in the eaton quartum model, we now have a much more improved version of the gravity model that also takes into account uh, this idea of multilateral uh, resistance. So let me go now to the estimation. So both Eaton Quartum and Krugman can give you a foundation for gravity. There is another model uh, that is called the Armington style model that also gives a foundation for gravity. So there are three ways you can actually um, give a foundation for the gravity model, right? Krugman, Eaton Quartum, and also the Armington style. So what is the basic gravity equation? So the gravity equation says log of um, xij, so that's trade flows. Uh, between i and j, here it's exports from i to j, is a function of uh, the GDP or expenditure of country i, the expenditure of country j, and the distance in between uh, the two countries. Now, distance is just a proxy for transport costs, uh, right? So one of the ways in which you can improve the gravity model is you can do a better job of capturing uh, frictions between two countries. Okay, So distance is just one way. There is, you can have tariffs, exchange rates, or, or, and other uh, friction or barrier uh, barriers to trade. Okay, so we start with that basic gravity equation. Now, when we go to the data, it is not enough if you just run this basic gravity equation because there are a lot of things you can do to improve your estimation. The first thing you need to do, the very, very important thing you need to do is account for this idea of multilateral resistance. So what is the idea of multilateral resistance? It is the idea that trade between two countries, so suppose we have trade between India and say Australia, uh, is not just a function of Indian GDP, Australian GDP, and the distance between the two countries, but it also depends on remoteness of India and remoteness of uh, Australia. In other words, multilateral resistance in India and multilateral resistance in Australia. What is multilateral resistance? Again, intuitively, you can think of it as what is the overall cost of, of supplying uh, goods to that particular country? And that is going to be high, of course, if you're very remote. So shipping things to Australia is, is very high cost. Right, which is why you, Australia generally has higher price levels. The same thing with New Zealand. So you have to account for this multilateral resistance uh, if you want to do a good job of, uh, or if you, if you want a good gravity model that can actually explain trade flows well. Now, let me just give you an example here. So bilateral frictions are not adequate to explain trade flows. Okay? So flows from country I to country J are influenced by the resistance to ICE shipments on its other possible destinations and the resistance of shipments to J from J's other possible sources of supply. 
So you have to account for these two resistance terms. Uh, an example is simply Japan, Australia, and Russia, right? So let's take uh, Russia as a country and suppose that it has two trading partners. It has Japan on the one hand and it has Australia on the other hand. Now I'm going to assume that all of these three are just the same size. So the economic size of Japan, Australia, Russia, they're all the same. And suppose that the distance between Russia and Japan is the same as the distance between Russia and Australia. It is not, but I'm just assuming that, right? So if we were to assume this, then let's look at the basic gravity model, right? So then you would predict that the trade flows between Russia and Australia is exactly the same as trade flows between uh, Russia and Japan. Why is that? Because, you know, you're going to have the same country size, for all of these countries. And we also know that the distance between them, at least between Russia and Japan and Russia and Australia is the same. So you would predict that the trade between Russia and Australia is equal to the trade between Russia and Japan, but that would not be right because once you account for multilateral resistance, you have to account for the fact that Australia has very high multilateral resistance relative to Japan because it is more remote than Japan. Okay, so that means this augmented gravity model would predict that trade flows between Russia and Australia would be very different compared to trade flows between Russia and Japan. And the intuitive reason for that is Australia uh, is very hard. It's very hard for Australians to source their products from elsewhere because it's so remote, whereas Japan can source its products from a variety of uh, variety of countries because it is more connected. Okay, so the, the trade between Russia and Japan will be very different from trade between Russia and Australia, given the multi resistance of Australia and Japan that are, that are different. So that's sort of the broad idea. And I can't emphasize this enough because any uh, modern gravity model needs to include uh, or control for multilateral resistance. How do you do this? All you need to do empirically is to have a fixed effect for uh, the importing country and a fixed effect for the exporting country. Hopefully you have data over time and you can do that, right? So that's the best way to do it. It assumes that multilateral resistance doesn't change over time, but that's not an unreasonable assumption to make given remoteness doesn't really change much over time, okay? All right, now the second thing I wanna emphasize is it comes out of the Mellitz model. So there is an interesting, uh, example, uh, sorry, interesting paper actually by Helpman, Melitz, and Rubinstein, HMR, that uh, talks about estimation of the gravity model. Now, those of you who have estimated some kind of gravity model before know that there is a problem, right? The problem is that most countries uh, are going to have a bilateral trade of zero. So not all countries trade with, with all other countries. And so if you look at bilateral trade data, a lot of it is missing because some countries don't trade with other countries, right? You, you cannot really do that, okay? Why not? Because what is the reason? So if you go back to the Mellitz model, what is the reason that two countries are not trading with each other? One of the reasons they're not trading with each other is that none of the firms in one country have been able to cover that fixed cost of exporting to the other country. That's why you see zero trade flows be between those countries, right? So if you don't account for this extensive margin effect, the fact that uh, a certain fraction of firms are exporting to uh, the other country, and that can also be zero if none of the firms jump the cost, then you're not, you're actually um, biasing your estimates on the intensive margin. Okay? So what Helpman, Mellitz and Rubinstein say is you have to run an augmented gravity model that also picks up the effect of uh, selection or this extensive margin, the idea that only a fraction of firms will export. Okay? That can also help you to take care of the zero trade flows in a sense. So what do you do with the helpman mellitz rubinstein model? Now that uh, model is a little complicated to, to estimate. So I have a more basic version of that model that you can try, but it's simply a Heckman selection model. Okay. So what do uh, helpman mellitz and Rubinstein say? They say that your augmented gravity model should look like this. You have exports on the left-hand side between countries I and J as a function of you know, I-specific variables. So this could be multilateral resistance, the GDP of country I, 
right? And similarly, GDP of country J, multilateral resistance of J, distance between I and J, and then this extra term WIJ. Okay? So the extra term WIJ is the fraction of exporting firms, which is a function of the productivity cut off in these uh, in these countries. So not accounting for this fraction, this extensive margin is going to result in uh, overestimation of the distance or in other words, the bilateral trade friction variables on the intensive margin. Okay? So we have to account for that extensive uh, margin impact. And so the way that uh, they deal with this is they use this Heckman two stage procedure. So in the first stage, uh, some of you who have done labor economics and econometrics will be familiar with what the Heckman selection procedure is, the Heckman selection model, right? So all you're going to do is that you're going to run this in two stages. So in the first stage, you're going to estimate the probability that a country I trades with country J. Okay? And that probability is a function of how many firms really are able to jump that, uh, that fixed cost. So in a sense, it is a function of the fixed costs of uh, exporting. So you estimate this probability of trading in a first stage probit model. You then get your uh, predicted probability of trading. And then you instrument using the estimated probability in the, st in the second stage. So that's your standard Heckman procedure. You get the predicted probability, stick that into the second stage, and that will control for this extensive margin selection effect. So the probability of trading is uh, is the probability that firms are productive enough to jump the fixed cost. Now that's going on in the background. In the data, of course, we don't have any information on these things. It's it's typically hard to get information on firms, right, in across countries. So what you can do is just use some kind of measure of fixed costs. So one of the World Bank, for example, asks firms how difficult is it to export uh, from your country and so on. You could use something like that. OK, um, and so you have to include uh, this correction for the probability of exporting in the second stage. Now, those of you familiar again with Heckman selection models know that ideally you need an excluded variable in the first stage. So there has to be some variable in the first stage that determines the probability of trading. Uh, that doesn't belong in the second stage, right? Why is that? Because if you are going to use the same variables in the first stage and the same variables in the second stage, because you're going to predict from the first stage and put that predicted probability in the second stage, you will run into multicollinearity issues, right? Because they are they're the same variables that you're using to predict. Okay. But the good thing is because of the functional form, it might not be exactly, these are nonlinear models, right? So they may not be exactly collinear. So you can still estimate, but it's not a wise thing to do. So it's always good to have some variable in the first stage that is not in the second stage. It's called an excluded variable. Now, HMR use religion or common religion as a variable that determines the probability of trading, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't drive the extent to which you trade. In other words, it impacts the extensive margin of trading, but not the intensive margin of trading. Okay, so that is what HMR um, recommend that you do. So the final thing I want to say is a few things on gravity. You have the basic gravity that's no longer good, right? What you need to do is do three important things. One, account for multilateral resistance. Ideally, if you have panel data, just stick in importer and exporter fixed effects. Uh, I hope you know what fixed effects are. So fixed effects, uh, you're just putting in a dummy variable for each exporter and a dummy variable for each importer. Dummy variable is just a zero one indicator variable for each importing country and each exporting country. Why do we do this? Because it will pick up uh, anything about that country that doesn't change over time. So anything we cannot observe, about that country, right? Unobserved heterogeneity at the country level that uh, it, it, the fixed effect will then pick up. So that's the idea. So put in the multilateral resistance fixed effects, try and control and or, or correct for selection. And the third thing you want to do is it's no longer uh, okay to simply have distance as your um, friction variable. The better that the better you can do in capturing trade frictions, for instance, including things like tariff barriers. Uh, the whether the countries have had a common colonizer, whether they speak the, a common language, whether they both speak English, whether they have the same legal systems, uh, all of those things, anything you can do to capture trade frictions between countries is going to improve your, your model. Yeah. 
any questions that I need to take before I can I get to the data? Three questions. One yes. is, uh, do you want me to put the give them all together or one by one? Uh, we one by one is fine. Okay. So uh, trade in services. How do we model? That? Is it included in graph? Uh, I mean, I have seen people do it, but it, you know, theoretically, the, we don't have much of a theory for trade in services. Okay, so remember that all of this comes from theoretical models, right? Uh, and so we just have more theory for manufacturing than trade and services. But I have seen the gravity model work for so many things, immigration, FDI. So, you know, you can, you can do trade and services. There's nothing stopping you. It's just that uh, how good the fit would be, et cetera, will, will, will depend. Okay, so the second one is uh, what is the... Uh fraction of exporting uh, firms in the data? Uh, we can't get it in the data. You, you can't get the fraction of exporting firms in the data. It's very difficult. So what you will do is that's what you're proxying by this probability uh, of exporting in, in a crude sense. Uh, but, but I think uh, there are some estimates, right? The Bernard Eaton uh, Jensen Portum paper, uh, under 10% or something. Uh, yeah, but I mean, if you want to do this in a gravity setting, then you're going to have to do it. For, you're going to have this for all countries, right? So you're going to need for each country uh, pair. What is the probably what is the fraction of firms that are exporting from this country to the other country? Right. Yeah, and, that's and ideally, true. I think uh, this one was a specific. I think it was out of gravity oh, question. Okay. But I should just wanted to understand what is the realistic. Yeah. Standard. Sure. I mean, you can look at uh, firm level data from each country. It will tell you how many firms are exporting. Typically, it's um, about 20% is what is very typical, right? But it will, of course, differ by country, pair and country and so on. Okay. Right. Uh, so some more it's... questions have come. Yeah, yeah. No, you can finish uh, with your earlier answer. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm done. That's all I had. Okay. So uh, can FTAs be an excluded variable? FTA. So typically you want something that will only increase the probability of trading uh, or uh, and not the extent of trading, right? So FTAs can actually, of course, they will increase the probability that you trade, but they will also increase the um, extent of trading, right? Because typically they go, come with um, lower tariff barriers and so on, FTAs. Okay. Right, so they, they are going to, um, yeah. it's very hard, it's very hard to find a variable that is excluded because anything that affects the probability will probably also affect the extent. Right. Uh, can we associate the gravity model with Brexit? Uh, you mean you want to look at the impact of Brexit on trade using the gravity model? Uh, I think that's the yeah, question. So, um, yes, you, you can do that. Um, but, the, the, I mean, empirically, it will be difficult. You can do it. There's nothing stopping you. But empirically, it will be difficult because uh, you will only get a pre and post, right? So you can see how Britain's trade changed uh, before Brexit and after Brexit. But how do you know that it's Brexit that is causing that change? You see what I'm saying? So it will be difficult to to actually causally estimate the impact of uh, Brexit on, on gravity. But I, I think if you think enough, hard enough, you might be able to figure out a way way to do it. So yeah, mechanically, you can do it. You can have a Brexit indicator, right? And see how, and stick that in the gravity model. That's that's possible. I'm going okay. to, I'm going to club two questions together. It's from the same person. So is XIJ, is it net or gross exports? That's one. And the other is, uh, why does extensive margin matter? Uh, can you clarify that one? Uh, okay. So basically, um, XIJ can be anything. I mean, you can use net or gross exports. There's in reality, there is very little difference between the two, right? So when you're taking theory to the data, then it becomes a question of what data do you have? Uh, so, I mean, theoretically, I think net exports would be ideal because you don't want any re-exporting information in there, but uh, often you don't have net export information for all countries, so that you may have to stick with gross exports, right? 
Uh, and then what there was another question I forgot what was the uh, um, yeah why does question? extensive margin matter oh why does extensive margin matter because um, you there might be a selection problem so what happens is that uh, by uh, if you ignore all the zeros right what are the zero flows the zero flows are are basically countries where the barriers are so high right that uh, these are not even trading so essentially by ignoring those countries you're only looking at a select sample of countries that are already trading with each other and you're making inference about the um, about the about trade barriers from the select sample of countries that are already trading and you're excluding the set of countries uh, that where the barriers are so high that they're not even um, in the sample right so it is a, it's a selection issue so you may be under or overestimating the impact of trade barriers if you're only looking at that select sample okay yeah. does that does that clarify yeah uh, okay all right so let's get to the data now can everyone see my screen clearly can you see the commands I think so. I can see it. I guess everybody can as well. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I am going to use Andrew Rose's uh, data here. So Andy Rose is a trade economist who was at uh, Berkeley, but he's now at NUS. Uh, and uh, he has a lot of free data on his website. So if you're interested, you can look at Andrew Rose uh, at his website to download data. So that's what I'm going to do. So here we have bilateral uh, trade flows data so what is bilateral trade bilateral trade is exports plus imports so it's a little bit different from just looking at exports right uh, because bilateral trade means you're adding up the exports from india to china plus china to india trade so that's what is called bilateral trade okay not all data sets are bilateral trade data sets so you have to be very very careful when you open up a data set you need to know what kind of uh, data set it is okay so this is uh, i unfortunately only have one screen so i'm wondering how to do this best let me see if i can minimize okay that might be better okay so the first thing we do what do we do when um, we get a data set anyone what what's the first thing you do when you get a data set Browse, very good. So clear is a good thing. Yes, so in, um, Stata users, you all probably know you should always be clearing everything before you start. So these are just uh, basics for Stata, right? So clear, clear meta, uh, because then it clears the memory. Uh, all of that's, uh, you know, set your matrix size. For some of the newer versions of Stata, you don't need to do these things because it does it on its own. The first thing you want to do is open your browser, also get a sense of what is the dimensionality of the data. For example, this is a bilateral data set, so it's important to know that, right? Because otherwise you'll be messing up your estimation. What you also need to know is what are the, the various variables and what are the thing, what do they mean, right? So in this case, it's a clean data set, so it's not a problem. So we have country one, country two, we have year. So this means this is a panel data set. So you're observing these countries over time. You have what is called as a pair ID. So pair ID means it's a country pair uh, partner um, ID. And then you have a whole range of variables, including distance, um, whether countries are landlocked, whether they're islands, whether they share common language, uh, a border, blah, 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 a whole bunch of these uh, trade cost variables and then um, there is also some extra information that we are going to come to soon but before we get there let me uh, do some some show you a few things about this uh, about the trade data right so first uh, I'm gonna do some data checks so first I'm gonna see uh, it's I'm not gonna scatter so I'm just gonna summarize the data so summarize L trade. So this is the log value of bilateral trade in uh, real dollars. It's always a good idea to summarize variables and note that um, typically if you want a normally distributed variable, then you're looking at the range of mean plus or minus three times the standard deviation. Okay. So what you want to do is see what the mean is plus or minus three times uh, the standard deviation, which is nine. So if you have observations that lie outside of that range, that is a signal. If you have a lot of observations lying outside of the range, that's a signal that this is not a very normal distribution. There might be outliers and so on. So that's a flag that you want to 
have in your head, right? So what I do is I usually just sum all of these variables to get a sense of uh, what they look like. Okay. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say count if year equals 1999. So this is a panel data set and I have this over time. If I do this for just one year, I have 7,268 variable um, observations for one year okay now if all countries were trading with all other countries then how many observations would we have for one particular e uh, year so there are 198 um, countries in this data set and because it is a bilateral data set then w once i have india to china i'm not going to have china to india right those are not different because i'm summing up the the trade imports plus exports so india to china is going to be the same thing as china to india in this particular case okay so how much should i expect to have i have 198 countries now if all of those 198 countries trade with every other country then the total number of observations I would expect is 198 minus 1 times 198 over 2. So n into n minus 1 over 2. Those are the trade relationships I would expect in a year. And that is 19,000. help me well it's rubenstein point is that most um, trade relationships are actually zero trade relationships okay? so not accounting for that is is not a good idea right okay so we have gotten a sense of the data we have bilateral um, uh, data let's tab the year and see how many years we have so we have years going all the way from 19 uh, let's say 1950 because this data is spotty for 90 for 48 and 49 so we have data from 1950 all the way to 1999 uh, between 198 countries. Okay. okay, so let's start with a basic gravity model. What is the basic gravity model that I'm going to run? So first I'm gonna run it in the cross section. So what I'm going to say is regress trade, right? This is bilateral trade on the log of distance between the two countries and the log of uh, the product of the real GDP. So LR GDP is already the log of uh, uh, country GDP one times country GDP two. So this is already, I don't have to separately put in the GDPs of the two countries because it has already been done in the data. Uh, another quick tip on the gravity model, um, typically the basic gravity model just has distance and GDP. But I often find that it's a good idea to also add GDP per capita. So theoretically, you don't need to add GDP per capita because the level of development is not a part of the gravity model. But I find that it actually helps uh, to add GDP per capita because it gives you better um, fit. Okay. okay, so I'm going to run this uh, for one year because I want to see what happens in the cross section first. Always, always, always correct your standard errors. So always do comma robust. Do not forget to correct your standard errors. Okay. So let me run the basic uh, gravity model here. Now, before I do this, what is our expectation on these different uh, variables? What do we expect is going to be the coefficient on distance? First of all, is it going to be negative or positive? It's going to be negative, right? Because it's gravity and distance will um, lower trade. Uh, what is going to be the coefficient on the product of the GDPs of the two countries? It is going to be equal to one. Okay? And we don't really have the, we don't have a prior on this. We're just putting it in there as a, as a control. Okay. okay, so what does robust standard error do is a question. Uh, robust is just... Uh, you're accounting for any um, serial correlation, for example, right? So heteroscedasticity and serial correlation robust uh, standard errors is what the option robust does. So always make sure you do that. Do not forget. Right. So here I am going to uh, run the regression. And here I have my coefficient. So distance is negative one as expected in the theory. Uh, GDP very close, to product of GDP is close to one, not quite there, 0.8. Uh, and then GDP per capita. All of these are statistically significant as can be seen from the p-value. So if the p-value is less than 0.01, uh, 
uh, that means it's significant at the 1% level. I also want to point out the R squared, which is 0.72. That tells you the fit of this model. It's a very high R squared, um, and that gravity model always does really well. So even something so basic is giving you quite a good fit, which tells us that distance and product of GDPs can really predict trade flows quite well. Right? It's a good good fit. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this separately for two sets of countries, developing and rich, right? So for developing, I'm going to look at Africa and for rich, I'm going to just look at the OECD countries. And here's my question to you. Uh, do you think that the fit of the model is going to differ for Africa versus rich countries? And if so, why? Anyone? Do you think the fit of the gravity model will differ for African countries versus rich countries? Uh, yes. Okay. Why? Why will it be? The so trade barriers are higher, I think, remote locations. I think these are the main. Okay, so trade barriers will be high. That is a good point, but that is simply going to show up as a as a different coefficient on distance, right? Why would the fit be different? So if the fit is different, it's telling you this is a good model, right? If you have a better fit, it's telling you this model explains um, a trade well for for rich countries or poor countries. Um, and so think think theoretically, always go back to the theory. So does theory tell us that this is a better fit for some countries rather than other countries? Okay, so if you remember Krugman and these types of uh, differentiated good models are, are better for uh, differentiated high-tech products, right? Uh, and they explain intra-industry trade. And, and that is a much more of a developed country phenomenon than a developing country pheno phenomenon. So this whole trade and differentiated products and varieties uh, driving trade applies a lot more to um, trade between advanced countries because they are the ones that import and export a lot of high tech products. African countries are probably importing and exporting more primary products where it is less likely that they are more differentiated. Right. And so the Krugman gravity style trade is less relevant for poor countries. At least that is a hypothesis that comes out of theory, but let's see if that holds uh, in the data. So I'm gonna do this Africa now. So only developing countries and, and it's Africa. So you guys were right, right? You can see that that distance coefficient has gone up now. And you, and as you said, uh, trade barriers are going to, to be more relevant for Africa. You're right, okay? Uh, not much of a difference with uh, GDP. So let's look at the fit. If you look at the fit, look at what happened to the R squared here, right? So it has gone down a little bit, in fact, substantially. And that is again to be expected because this model performs much better for um, rich countries. Doesn't mean that you cannot use it for other countries. It's just that it that is that's it's the way uh, the data is is structured. Uh, yes, data availability also matters, of course. Uh, it also matters. So that can also drive um, some of these uh, uh, these observations. So if you do this for rich countries, you will get much better fit, uh, 0.88. So this is a quite a good R squared here. Okay, okay so now I'm going to bring in the panel dimension a little bit. So because we have um, data over time, there's a lot better we can do. First of all, we should be... Uh, Sorry, I did, can everyone see okay? Uh, no, I think, yeah, sorry. Uh, we can see the screen. I think uh, ca cascade option so that both screen can be seen. What is cascade option? I've never used that before. Do you know how to do that? I haven't used that in Windows. No. Okay, so let's just uh, go with this and, and hope. Yeah. As long as you can okay. see the results window. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, we can see. It's fine. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I am now going to start exploiting the panel uh, nature of this database, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I have um, uh, some, uh, I'm gonna introduce your fixed effects. So first, 
I'm going to run this model, but I'm going to account for annual shocks. So what does um, year, what do year fixed effects do? This means I'm going to have an indicator variable for each year. And that means that any shock, any macroeconomic shock that impacted the whole world uh, at a given point in time is going to be accounted for using these year fixed effects. Okay. So that is what I'm going to do. The other thing I will do is also I will start paying more attention to my standard errors. Uh, and so here you can see that I'm clustering by pair ID, right? So clustering is extremely important uh, for inference. You have to always cluster your standard errors. So what I'm going to do is run this particular equation. So the only difference here is I'm now beginning to put an XI in front of the regression and I have an I dot year which means I have an indicator variable for each year in the data. Okay, so once you do that, again, not much has changed in terms of uh, your uh, estimates, right? So distance is still negative one, which is what I would expect from theory. L GDP is again close to uh, 0.8, and then GDP per capita is now quite significant. So note that I am now using a lot more observations. So number of observations has gone up because I'm using all the years uh, in the data. Can anyone tell me why I'm using clustering? Why is clustering important? So it's very important to cluster because what clustering does is it, it essentially accounts for the fact that any shocks that are specific to a particular pair ID uh, can um, translate over time, right? So if I cluster by pair ID, what I'm saying is uh, any particular bilateral pair is a group, okay? So suppose a pair ID is India-China. So by clustering the India-China observations, what I'm saying is any shock to an India-China trade a relation in one year can uh, actually spill over to all of those, um, to all the years, right? So that is what the clustering is doing. And so by otherwise, what the model or for, for instance, data will otherwise think that all of these observations are different observations while actually they are the same relationship, right? So Stata will think that all of these relationships are different and I need to tell Stata that, look, these are the same, This these observations belong to the same bilateral pair. And so any um, shock will belong to all of those observations. That's what the, the clustering can do. Uh, and now, now that we have established this, some of you have been telling me that I can use more fixed effects, and that is true. We are going to go there, but I just wanted you to get a sense of how we include the fixed effects, right? So I dot year means year fixed effects ac accounting for these um, annual shocks, right? Okay, so far so good. Any Any important questions that I'm missing? So bear in mind, gravity works well for certain groups of countries and certain products. It doesn't work so well for others. And that's because of the theory, the way um, international trade works in differentiated products, right? Um, any questions that I should take? Gautam, you see any? There way? are uh, no particular questions. I think you have answered uh, trade war issue be covered by clustering. I think uh, we have already answered that. Uh, mm -hmm. Then can you show the plot of clustered error? Uh, I can. I can show why do we need the plotting of clustered uh, errors here. You can, but it is always a good idea to just cluster. Okay. So let me get through this, and then um, if I have time, I'm going to show the the plot. Okay. So let's just see. Uh, what I okay. So now we are going to. It's always so far what I've done is simply estimated the basic gravity model, right? So I just wanted to show you what the basic gravity model looks like. But now we are going to ask a particular question. So what we're going to do, just like there was a question on Brexit, right? We are going to see what the impact of the WTO has been on bilateral trade. So the question we're going to ask is: Does WTO impact trade? Right? Does WTO membership impact international trade? And this comes to Andrew Rose's uh, paper in the AER where he showed, where he looked at the impact of the World Trade Organization on trade. And that's exactly, I'm just following what he did. Okay. So first, how would I answer that question? The first thing I would do is I would use, like my, I would use my basic gravity model, right? So I'm going to run the basic gravity model here, regress trade on distance, GDP, GDP per capita. Uh, I'm going to run it for one year first before doing it for all other years. 
I'm going to cluster by pair ID and I'm going to put in two variables of interest. So this is called one in and both in. So these are the two variables I'm going to use. One in says if one country, either, either of the two in the bilateral pair belong to the WTO and both in uh, says if both of the countries in the, in the pair are actually uh, in the WTO. Okay. So let's run that regression and see uh, what we get. This is simply in the cross section. It's not a great thing, but I will come back to the, to the full panel at some point. Okay. So let's look at this. Now we have a question in mind, right? We are trying to evaluate the impact of joining the WTO. So let's look at the coefficients on one in and both in. First of all, let's confirm that every, everything else is looking good. Distance is still negative, uh, close to one uh, GDP 0.8, right? Product of GDPs. Now one in and both in, uh, this is telling us that when countries join the WTO, uh, trade actually goes down between them. Do you think this makes sense or is this, is this nonsensical? This is certainly not what we would expect, right? I would either expect no effect or I would expect the membership to WTO to actually increase trade. So what we need to now think about is I can use, I have so much data, I have a panel data set. So now I can start improving my gravity model to be able to get a better um, uh, estimate on these coefficients, right? So now I am going to start using the uh, entire uh, data set that I have. So let's improve uh, the gravity model. First thing we're going to do is we're, in, we're going to remove that if year equals 1999. So I'm going to use all my data. I'm also going to do a better job. Instead of just having distance, I'm going to have all the other trade friction variables that I can use. Okay, so remember, I have a whole list of them here. Um, so I'm going to put all of those in. That will already improve my um, estimate. And of course, right now I'm not doing the multilateral resistance, right? So you can do that in your um, uh, later, but let's see how this improves the, uh, the full model. Okay. So okay, let me first try including time fixed effects. I'm going one at a time. So here I'm running this, the same model, but I am now going to use all the data and I'm going to use your fixed effects. Okay, so your fixed effects are in. I have used all the years I have. I have clustered uh, pair ID, and now I can look at one in and both in, and bingo, uh, now we are beginning to get more sensible results, right? So one in is not really significant, but both in is uh, positive and statistically significant. So what this is saying is, once I have improved my data set, um, uh, my estimation a little bit, so I included these year dummies, I used all the data that I have, uh, I find that both in is actually positively uh, related to, to trade, right? So membership to the WTO by both countries uh, is, uh, incre is, is, is good for trade, okay? Now, you will then tell me that, look, you can do a lot better, right? I can, um, I can include a lot of the control variables, so I'm going to do the full model with all the controls. Okay, and then see if uh, one in and both in are still significant. Okay, so what is the full model now? So in the full model, I have included not just distance and GDP, but whether countries are landlocked, islands, border, common language, common colony, blah, 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 blah. And then I have one in and both in. And what you find is both in is still positive and statistically significant. Okay, so the first improvement I made is use all the data you have account for annual shocks, throw in as many controls as you can. Now I have not still, this is still a very, very basic uh, gravity model, right? So what are the two things that I have not accounted for that I told you that we should account for? Anyone, what should I, how should I improve this? What is, what should I be putting in? Yes, very good. Multilateral resistance is not in here. I should be using importer and exporter fixed effects. The second thing I need to do is I haven't corrected for, for selection here, right? So zero trade flows, extensive margin, none of that fancy stuff I have done. So now I'm going to 
um, take you to another data set, more recent, because this is a very, very old one. I will let you play around with this, by the way. So those, you have access to the file. You can always play around with um, with this and kind of throw in these exporter and importer fixed effects. It will take a while for me to run it. That's why I'm not going to run everything here, uh, because each regression takes a while with all the fixed effects. So feel free to use the data set and just play around with the multilateral resistance. So what I am going to do now is to go to a different uh, data set that is more recent, uh, and I am going to uh, do all the fancy stuff that we talked about with this data set. So what this data set is, is it is a um, sector by country pair by year data set. Okay. So it comes from the World Bank's uh, trade and productivity database. Uh, I have uh, the C code, country code, partner code, I have the year. And the nice thing is I also have industry level data, right? Now the thing is it's too, it will be too big if I use all of the industry. So I have restricted it to just two industries here. So I have restricted the data set. I have import value and export value. Okay? And then I have some other uh, gravity variables like island and landlocked and uh, distance between the two countries, whether they share a border, so on and so forth. So the nice thing about this data set is import flows and export flows are different. And I have data on country pair year and across industries. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to generate the log of exports, right? Now note that the export TV is going to be zero for, for a lot of countries as we know. Okay. And so when I take log, if I wanna retain the zeros, typically I can just say log of one plus the exports because I want to keep the zeros. If I take a log of zero, then I'll just lose all those observations. They'll become missing. So that is what I am going to do here. Generate log exports. Okay. Uh, so here the log transformation is still keeping the zeros, right? So I'm cheating in a sense. I'm going to generate a pair ID. So I'm going to generate a number for each country. This is useful because I can put in fixed effects at some point. Uh, and then I am going to, I have written a for loop. Again, I'm releasing the do file so you can play around. I'm going to take logs of all the relevant uh, variables like GDP per capita and so on and so forth. So that's what I'm going to run here. Uh, I'm now going to generate, remember I want to run a uh, full, I want to run a full gravity model, right? So I want to account for multilateral resistance using fixed effects. And I also want to account for selection at some point. So I am going to generate a dummy variable, an indicator variable, which is a zero uh, for uh, with, when the exports are zero, and it's one if the exports are positive. Okay? So it's just an indicator variable that picks up whether a country is exporting to the other country or not. Okay? So I'm going to run that. I'll generate that, and then I will generate another variable that is log of exports, but one that will keep the missings. So this one is a little bit different from the previous log of exports because this one doesn't have the one plus. So if exports are zero, then this ln exp one is going to be missing. And I need this for the, the Heckman model. Okay. okay, so let me first run these uh, simple models and then I will come to the Heckman selection model. So the first model that I'm gonna run is this here. And I want to show you what this is. It's simply, I'm going to define a var list one. So I'm def defining a variable list that is simply all the gravity variables. So it has the distance, it has the GDP of the part of one country, the GDP of the other country, and it also has the GDP per capita. Okay. Then I'm going to generate a var list two, which is an augmented uh, variable list in the sense that it has all the other friction variables, border, common language, landlocked, island, and so on. Okay. And then uh, I have another var list three that is simply just the border and, and common language. So the first thing I'm going to do is just run the basic uh, models here, models. Okay. So let, let me just, in fact, go to the full multilateral resistance term. Okay, so the first model I'll run is log of export on all the gravity variables, including distance, GDP uh, per capita, and, and so on. 
uh, and I'm going to have a, a few fixed effects here. First, I dot ISIC2 is an industry fixed effect because remember I have two types of industries in my model. So I dot ISIC2 will be an industry fixed effect. I dot CNO will be a country one fixed effect. Uh, I dot PNO will be the country two fixed effect. So I have importer and exporter fixed effects. That means I'm accounting for multilateral resistance. I have I dot year, so I'm accounting for year specific shocks and I'm clustering by pair ID. Okay, so that is how I would run uh, the first model. So this is when I account for multilateral resistance. Now this is going to take a while, so please bear with me. And now we have our estimates on the various gravity variables. So you can already see that the uh, LN uh, KM is actually negative two, right? If I didn't have the fixed effects, so here I'm going to run it without the multilateral term. Oh, sorry, it forgot. So here it is without the fixed effects, right? So without the fixed effects, the um, coefficient on LMKM is negative 1.9, whereas when I ran it with fixed effects, I get a completely different coefficient on distance. So I got something like negative 2.5. That's a pretty big difference in the distance coefficient. So not accounting for multilateral resistance terms is going to change the, um, the coefficients on your other bilateral friction variables. That's why we say account for multilateral uh, resistance. Okay, the second thing we're gonna do is we are going to throw in all of our other controls. So let's throw in all the different controls and still keep in our fixed effects. Okay, so let's go back now. So what improvements did I make? I still have the fixed effects in, but I have also thrown in some other variables. For instance, border okay, and common language, right? So the coefficient on distance went down a little bit because I also have other controls here for frictions. I have a border effect which says if countries share a border, they trade more. And if countries share a common language, they're going to trade more. So you see how anything I do, the, the more I augment the model, the more, the more the, uh, there's changes in these in this um, distance variable, right? So this is why you need to be very careful. As many uh, friction variables as you can need to be included in the augmented gravity model, okay? And the final thing that I'm going to do is run a Heckman selection uh, model, right? So the way to run a Heckman is the command in Stata is simply Heckman. So you have to run Heckman log of exports one, because this is a variable that is that has the uh, missing uh, value for trade if trade is zero. So if trade is zero, then ln x one is going to be missing. Then you have your usual gravity variables. You have your fixed effects, I dot uh, industry, I dot country to, for multilateral resistance. You have your fixed effects, and then you have the selection equation in the first stage. So the Heckman selection will run the first stage regression to estimate the probability of exporting. And for that, you have the selection equation. So you define select and then brackets dx. If you remember, dx is that dummy variable that says zero, one, if you are exporting or you're not exporting, right? So that's the selection equation dependent variable. And then I'm telling Stata that it has to cluster uh, the standard errors. Now note that here, I don't have an excluded variable. I don't have an excluded variable because the, the independent variables in the first stage are the same in my case. They're just your gravity variables and the border and common language. And I can, it's not its not the best thing to do. I'm getting away with it uh, because fu it's functional form identification because it's a nonlinear model. It will still be identified, but I don't recommend that you do that. So I recommend that when you're running the Heckman model, please include any excluded variable like common religion or something. Okay, that, that, that way it will give you better estimates. 
Okay, so let me run the Heckman selection model. The good thing with Stata is it will do it for you. You don't have to really um, code anything in, right? Um, so bear with me, this is going to take a while. Note that it's a nonlinear estimation, so it's going to, hopefully it will converge. Sometimes it doesn't converge, which is another challenge that people face with the Heckman, is that you, you may not always get it to converge. Uh, so then you have to play around a little bit with your control variables if it doesn't converge, because it depends on the uh, on the optimum, right, on the numerical optimization. In the meanwhile, maybe you can uh, address this question. Why do we have lower R squared with all the controls than a simple model which we use first? Um, so let me see where the R squared number is here. I think the issue this person may be comparing the R squared from the earlier regressions where uh, we had this uh, sync yeah. observation for country pair. Correct. So one thing again, remember that these are two different data sets, right? So the the these regressions I'm running with this other industry level data set that's totally different. So I haven't really compared uh, like to like. But look, this is the R squared, right? So it's not really the adjusted R squared. So note that um, if you want to directly compare, then especially if you're adding new variables, then you should be comparing the adjusted R squared, not the actual R squared, right? Uh, so it is possible when you add more variables that your R squared actually goes down uh, because uh, the, those extra variables may not be, um, the, their T stats often, if they're lower than one, then your R squared can go down, okay? Uh, but again, don't look, once I just mentioned that, oh, here we have the, uh, the estimate. So here is the Heckman result. Okay, and if you look at the co the coefficient on log kilometers, what you will find is it's now much lower, right? So negative 1.49, much lower than what we were finding earlier. The good news is border and common language still seem to be relevant. They're still positive and significant, but the coefficient on kilometers has come down quite a bit, which means that if you hadn't um, accounted for selection, you might have been overestimating the, the importance of distance in your model. Okay, so this is why it is quite important to uh, run a selection model. Now, what is the selection model doing? What it has done is it ran a first stage regression estimating the probability that two countries trade. And then it calculated the predicted probability and stuck that in as a uh, dependent variable um, in, in the second stage. So that is how it runs this. So you see the selection equation here. Something is off because I'm not getting standard errors, but typically that's the selection equation. And then it calculates the hats, right? The row hats, which is the predicted probabilities, and then puts that in as a dependent variable in the second stage. So that is what the Hickman does. Uh, so to summarize on gravity, uh, what is the, uh, I have told you what the simple gravity model is, and then I have told you what the augmented gravity model is. One, please account for multilateral resistance using importer and exporter fixed effects. Include as many controls as you can uh, for uh, distance and, and trade barriers. And then third is try and control for selection. It may not always be uh, relevant, particularly if you're looking at advanced countries and simply focusing on advanced countries, sometimes selection doesn't matter because advanced countries trade a lot with other countries. But if you have an overall uh, sample of all countries, that selection can become quite important. So use the, the HMR or Heckman uh, selection technique. So you already have the code. So I'm gonna let you play around with it in the interest of time because Gotham, I think we are running out of time here, right? Um, do we have time yeah. to look at the, the other, the productivity stuff? We have half an hour remaining. Oh no, sorry. And this, uh, this, we have uh, maybe 20 minutes. Okay. So yeah. do you guys want me to go to the productivity uh, stuff or? Uh, yeah, I, I can do it. There will be a mixed response. Uh, yeah. Okay. So are you running uh, with fixed effect or panel 
fixed defense hd drag or uh, this thing ah so this is you can do it either ways right so i am running this as not as xd reg because i i like uh, to have control especially when you have so many dimensions i like to have control over the fixed effects right so i like to just use the xi i dot because then i can have all these different dimensions Okay. Uh, one very important um, uh, tip for those of you who are interested in gravity, uh, Yoto Yotov, who is at Drexel, um, has this really amazing page on structural gravity estimation. Okay. And uh, everything I talked to you about here, it, which was very quick, uh, he actually explains uh, really well. And he has a lot of these papers and, and data that is freely available uh, that talks about the different uh, about everything I talked about right now. How do you account for multilateral resistance? How do you account for selection? Um, how do you run a more augmented gravity models, right? So I would encourage you, if you're interested in gravity and you want to use it to actually estimate something, uh, then I encourage you to go to his webpage. It's Yoto Yotov uh, is the um, is the author. And it's all free stuff. You can, you can just browse his site and you'll get info. Yeah, I think there are some requests and questions about the same thing, but I think you've already covered some of that. And it's like a request to repeat some of the stuff, but maybe they can uh, look at uh, this web page. Uh, yeah, get some more I think this web page is a, is a great source. Right. Of, uh, so yeah. then we can move on then. Okay, so let me move on to productivity estimation. Again, look, in the interest of time, I'm going to do it very quickly, right? Um, so. Uh, the first thing is it is an important and a very, very big area of the literature. So um, actually estimating productivity and markups is very important if you want to look at the impact of trade on firms, as we have seen from the, the Mellitz model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce to you the uh, really the fundamental paper that uh, Pavchnik, Nina Pavchnik's 2002 paper on the impact of trade on, um, uh, on firms. And uh, because she does a very good job of calculating productivity, and particularly she uses this technique called the Oli Pekis uh, productivity estimation technique. So I'm going to start there because that is important, right? So we are going to start with a basic production function. How do you estimate productivity, right? Typically what people will do is a very, very quick way or the starting point for all this is that you estimate um, a production function for the farm, right? So you have firm output on the left-hand side, and you regress that on some measure of variable input. So XT is typically materials and labor. These are the typical variable inputs for the firm. You can even add fuel and energy and stuff like that. Um, and then you have capital stock, which is sort of the fixed uh, input, right? And then you have the error term, which you can decompose into two. So the first is uh, omega T, which is the productivity, right? So if you remember omega T, well, the notation is different here, but think of omega as sort of your Mellitz uh, productivity at the firm level. And then plus mu of T, mu of T is your standard error term, the idiosyncratic uh, mean zero error term. Okay? Now, what is the standard measure to compute productivity? What you can do is just run an OLS regression, uh, like I said here. So simply regress output on variable inputs capital and then look at the residual. Okay. So all you do is compute a residual as, sorry, so did, I hope this is visible, but I'm going to, yeah. So the residual is just going to be yt yeah. minus beta not hat minus beta hat xt minus beta hat k, kt. So this is the residual coming out of this regression. Now, what is the idea behind this? The idea is fixing the level of inputs. If you are able to produce more output, then that means that you are a more productive firm. Okay, so that is the idea behind this, is that uh, firms that are more productive can produce more for the same fixed level of inputs. Now, the problem with this is that the beta hat k, which is the coefficient you get on capital, is actually biased if you run an OLS regression. And so OLS is no longer accepted as a way to, to measure productivity. So why is that? Now, the way it works is, so Pavchnik's 2002 paper inspired from Oli Pekis has the, the uh, where she actually derives the, uh, solves the plant's problem and she actually derives these um, uh, elasticities, right? So let's think about a plant that is maximizing uh, profits, right? So the, uh, the firm is maximizing profits V, which is just the maximum of the liquidation value. So this is if it doesn't produce anything, it just liquidates. 
and the profit minus cost, right? And C is a function of IT, which is uh, just investment uh, in this in this particular model. So you have uh, profits as a function of the capital stock okay, and the productivity level of the firm. And you have an equation that tells you how capital evolves. So the capital stock in the period T plus one is just capital stock in the beginning of the period minus depreciation plus any new investments that the firm makes. Now, here's the way that we think about the firm. So the firm can actually observe its own uh, productivity shock omega IT. So the problem is that while the firm can observe omega, we as the econometricians, we cannot observe omega. Okay, so the firm observes Omega, it then um, basically has a guess on what the Omega is going to be in the next period. So it guesses Omega T plus one from the Omega draw, the productivity draw in this period. And then it looks at how much capital it has, which is KT. It then decides what capital stock it wants in the next period, KT plus one, right? And then after having considered KT, its productivity omega, and then its expected productivity in the next year, it then decides how much investment it wants to undertake in this period so that it gets a capital stock of KT plus one. In other words, the decision of the firm uh, uh, to invest in capital is a function of the productivity. So that is the simultaneity problem uh, that biases this coefficient. Okay. So if you simply run an OLS, you are going to bias the coefficient on beta K because there's productivity hiding in this residual. So the firm can observe productivity, but you cannot observe productivity. Productive firms will adjust their capital stock. And of course, they will adjust output. And so you will get a biased estimate on beta K. So that's the big problem. Right. And the way that um, Pouchnik solves for this is using this Oli Pekis methodology, where essentially the idea is that you use this investment as a proxy for productivity. So because you observe the investment that the firm is making and you also observe the capital stocks, you can actually infer by a sort of reverse argument what the productivity of the firm is, or at least the productivity that it can see and that it can predict. So the idea is to use investment as a proxy for productivity. Now, the second problem that uh, we have here, which the Oli Pekis method also addresses, is the exit problem, right? So note that from the Mellitz model, firms can observe their productivity, and if they think that they cannot cover their entry costs, right, and then they're going to exit. So if they exit the market, you're only going to look in your data set at firms that are already in the market. So there's another selection problem that you're not observing um, exiting low productivity exiting firms. Okay? Now that's also going to bias your beta hat K. So what we're going to try and do with the Oli Pekis method is with assumptions on how um, Omega and K evolve, we are going to uh, basically try to address the two problems, the simultaneity problem and the exit problem. Okay. So suppose we assume that investment is a function of productivity and capital. So I already told you the story, right? The firm will invest depending on what productivity it observes, which determines what it expects in the next period and the capital stock that it has in this period. Okay. So let's look at uh, two ways in which we can address the simultaneity bias and the uh, selection bias. Okay. How do we correct simultaneity bias? Well, first we're gonna invert the investment rule. Okay. That investment rule is just I is a function of KT and omega T. And we're gonna write uh, productivity as a function of capital stock and investment. So the idea is let's proxy productivity using capital stock and investment that we have in the data. Yeah. So YT is a function, this is your standard production function, but now I have written beta, uh, beta K, KT. Um, oh, what is this? Sorry, there's something popping up uh, something popped up saying request to annotate the shared content. I don't know what that is. Uh, actually, I don't see it on your screen. Uh, is it from WebEx? It's it's from a participant and it says uh, uh, requesting to annotate shared content. I see. Yeah, do, is it me? Am I the participant? No, or no, no, no. It's another participant. Maybe I say decline and then we can see what yeah. happens. Okay. Sure. All right. 
So what we're going to do is we are going to approximate, right, lambda with a polynomial expansion in capital and investment. And we're going to stick that polynomial here. So on the right hand side, in your regression, you're going to have YT on the left output. On the right, you're going to have labor and capital, uh, sorry, labor um, and materials, which are your variable inputs. And then you're going to have some polynomial function of capital stock and uh, investment, because that is going to proxy for productivity that is hiding in the residual, essentially. Okay? Now, once you do that, then it allows you to estimate this beta hat on the variable inputs consistently, right? And then in the next stage, what you're going to run, once you have estimated the beta hat on the variable inputs, then we can use that beta hat to calculate y minus beta hat xt on the left-hand side. And so on the right-hand side, all you're left with is capital and productivity and the idiosyncratic uh, error term. Okay. Now, the next step is we're going to decompose the productivity into a, an expected version that the firm will see, right? The firm can see its productivity in period T and it estimates it or it, it forms an expectation of that productivity in T plus one. Uh, and then an idiosyncratic version of productivity that even the firm cannot uh, really anticipate. If the firm can't anticipate, we don't care about it because that's not an endogeneity problem. We only care about the part of productivity that the firm can anticipate, right? So we decompose uh, productivity into two, we ignore the, unantici the uh, unanticipated part. And then here, all we're going to do is do the same thing again. So we have a function of the productivity here, and I'm going to use my proxy function, the control function, which is a polynomial in KT and IT to capture this, um, this omega T. Okay. Now, you don't have to really worry about any of this because only Peikis and all of these estimation techniques are already pre-programmed, right? So they are going to be, we have Stata commands that can do this, but I still want you to know what we're doing with the only Peikis uh, method. The next thing is we correct for the selection bias, exactly like we did with Helpman, Melitz, and Rubinstein. So in, a, in another stage of the regression, we're going to estimate the probability of staying in the market with a probit. Right? So estimate the probability of staying in the market, get predicted probabilities. And once you get that predicted probability, you will just stick that in as another control variable. So in the in, in reality, the Oli Peikis method consists of three stages. Stage one, run this particular regression here, output on the left, variable regressed on variable inputs and a polynomial function of capital and investment with the idea that investment will capture or will proxy for productivity. Recover your betas, which is the coefficients on the variable, variable inputs. And then in the second stage, run your probit regression, get the, uh, the probability of staying in the market. And then in the final third stage, you're going to run a regression that looks like this. Yt minus beta hat xt plus 1 on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, you have your capital stock, uh, the polynomial function in kt and it. And then you're also going to include that uh, predicted probability to account for exit. Okay, So it's a three-stage regression. Uh, and the basic idea is use investments in physical capital as a measure of productivity that the firm can observe that you cannot observe. Yeah. Okay, so people have uh, looked at this. I'm going to take a few more minutes, and I think I can also spend a few minutes um, tomorrow, I think, maybe the first 15 minutes or so uh, going through the regression, right? So there have been studies that use this Oli Peikis uh, method. And uh, you can look up these studies, Krishna and Mitra for India, Taibout and Westbrook look at Mexico. They all do this Oli Peikis estimation and look at the impact of trade on firm level productivity. Okay. Now, I do have some slides on markups, uh, but I'm not going to go through that because I want to have time. Right. So markup estimation is also, it, it comes out of the productivity estimation, uh, but I'm not going to have time to cover markup estimations. Let's look at how we actually estimate productivity. There are two ways to do this. One is a revenue-based production function, and the other is a physical productivity production function, right? So for the revenue-based production function, you're going to be estimating these betas. The betas are also called output elasticities because they're tracking, if you change input a little bit, how much does output change, right? That's what your betas are doing in that uh, production function. So these are called the output elasticities. 
and you can recover them uh, from revenue production functions. But the problem is that the revenue production function conflates productivity and markups because you're using sales, let's say, on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, you're using expenditure on materials, expenditure on labor. So those are dollar values, right? And so they also conflate uh, the markup. Ideally, what you want is just physical quantity of outputs, physical labor, physical uh, materials, right? And that's what your physical productivity function should be, but that's very hard to get. Um, so ultimately you end up using this revenue function, but keep in mind that the revenue production function will conflate markup and um, productivity. So uh, you can estimate TFPQ if you're lucky enough to have physical data on out outputs and inputs, or you can actually use price deflators. So I would point people to the Smiths and Warzynski JIE paper in 2013 that tells you how to construct price deflators at the firm level so that you can um, you don't have to work with revenue production functions anymore. You can just deflate everything at the firm level and you can work with physical uh, TFPQ production functions, right? So look up the Smiths and Wierzynski paper. There's another paper by DeLocker et al. 2016, extremely complicated, right? And uh, but, but a very rigorous paper that estimates productivity using firm product level data. So this is technically a difficult paper. I would say your bottom line is use, use Smiths and Wierzynski if you can. And if you have the data and the appetite for more advanced estimation, then use the DeLocker uh, et al. 2016. Okay. okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. I won't be talking about markups. And then when I come in tomorrow, I will show you the Levinson Petrin, which is just another way of doing the old Pekis. Uh, and uh, I will estimate, uh, maybe I'll take about 15 minutes tomorrow to estimate, to actually use the data to estimate um, productivity. And so, so that is the plan. So I think I'll let you go now because I think we've run out of time. Uh, Gautam, is that, is that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think if we can cover some of this uh, in tomorrow's lecture, uh, yes. we can, that'll be good. Yes, I think people are asking for recordings, chat history. So chat history, I think when you end this uh, meeting, you will get an option to save uh, the material. Maybe you can do it that way. I don't think uh, there is an op way to get chat history from yesterday or the day before, unless you have saved it, saved it or somebody else has saved it and uh, is willing to share. Um, yeah, then there's one request. Can we get all the slides of the lectures together? I think it's, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you yeah, can so, just combine them yourself, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, everything is on Dropbox. Every At yes. least everything that I'm allowed to share is on Dropbox. I can't share the firm level data because it's proprietary. So that is not on Dropbox, but the gravity estimation data, the log file for the firm data, it's all on Dropbox. Right. Yeah, I think you, get, you can, uh, so even the slides, uh, they are all you know on the, in the Dropbox folder, except for tomorrow's, which will be put yes. there very soon. Yes, uh, and tomorrow I'm going to spend the first 15 or 20 minutes on this productivity estimation. Uh, and then I will spend the rest of the time talking about trade policy, right? So uh, tariffs, quotas, export subsidies, uh, anti-dumping duties, and so on. So that's the plan. Yeah, I think that should be. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, and uh, I hope to see everyone tomorrow. Right.